Dear guests, dear followers, good morning to you all. And welcome to the online session of Panel 7, aiming at exploring the emergent and disruptive technologies, applications in planning military operations in cyberspace. I'm Colonel Mihai Burlaku, and I'm very pleased to be invited to take part and moderate this online morning session morning conference panel organized today by the Romanian Military Thinking, which is, as you probably know, our Journal of Military Science and Security Studies, published and supported by Romanian Defense Staff that is hosting the event on the occasion of its 162 years anniversary. I'd like to start our discussion addressing a warm welcome to our very distinguished members of our panel and to you all, encouraging your contributions through comments and questions. In this respect, it is my pleasure to inform you that we are going to have a final session when you are invited to participate using the chat service. Of course, I will collect your thoughts and questions regarding the conference. Today, our panel consists of seven panelists. The time allocated to the presentations delivered is approximately 15 minutes each, sequenced one after another without breaks. The panelists and their topics will be introduced before each presentation. So, as I said, uh, there will be a question and answer session, a Q&A session right after that. For panelists, make sure you are all muted and uh, demute when you speak to avoid any interference. As I said, in order to encourage discussions, obtain insights and create opportunities for as many participants as possible, there will be questions from both the moderator and online followers. We invite only one question per follower. Please state the targeted panelist or panelist prior to addressing your question. Keep it short, clear, and to the point. The panelists will try to respond in the same manner, I hope. This being said, let us dive into the substance of this panel session. So the cyberspace is a unique domain in which technologies play a crucial role. These technologies create new vulnerabilities to exploit for attackers, but also offer potential opportunities for defenders. While some of the innovative ideas are already being implemented uh, as part of capability development or experimentation, together we must continue to recognize shortfalls and adapt accordingly. Looking to the long-term requirements, emerging technologies will bring radical changes both to the overall threat landscape, but also to NATO-led missions, operations, and overall organizational cyber security posture. The Light Command Transformation, uh, in a paper I consider that you are aware about, NATO Cyberspace Strategic Foresight Analysis, uh, is pointed out, is points out that our potential competitors and adversaries in cyberspace will increasingly leverage cyber as a component and their warfare strategies, notably in the contest on hybrid and information operations. With the advancements anticipated in technology in the next 10 years, it is highly likely that each of these players will first enhance their capabilities for destructive and disruptive cyber attacks, as well as, of course, strategic intelligence collection and espionage efforts, military operations, including electronic warfare capabilities and information operations. So, uh, now I'm uh, actually uh, inviting uh, uh, Dr. Greg Melker, the Chief Operations Officer for the New Generation Warfare Center. He is also affiliated with the Virginia Tech Applied Research Corporation and uh, Alien uh, Science and Technology. To take the floor uh, and to 
give us uh, his views. Uh, he was a senior fellow at the Potomac Foundation and recently graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a master's in global policy. In a prior position, he was a vice president leading national security analysis at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, where he substantially grew their portfolio in modeling, simulation, and analysis for U.S. Department of Defense and Homeland Security clients. He also established and led their efforts to counter China's anti-access area denial and the Russian strategic initiative. Dr. Melker, please take the floor. Hope you hear us. It seems that Dr. Melkor haven't joined us yet, so we are uh, in the position to move to the next speaker, who is uh, actually a cyber uh, subject matter expert, a NATO cyber expert, Major Fotios Canelos uh, from uh, Joint Air Power Competence Center. Who, uh, Major uh, Canelos graduated from the Hellenic Air Force Academy. So, uh, uh, Major Canelos graduated from the Hellenic Air Force Academy in 2003 as an electrical engineer with specialization in telecommunication and computer science. He holds three master degrees, one in technical economic systems, one in environmental sciences, and another in, in uh, European and international studies. Uh, Major Canelos served as an inspection engineer and system engineer at the Hellenic Air Training Command in Kalamata. His previous appointment was at the Hellenic Air Force Support Command managing IT and cyber security projects. His current appointment is as a cyberspace subject matter expert at the Joint Air Power Competence Center. Major Canelos, if you hear us, please take the floor to deliver your intervention. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, unfortunately, I'm facing some issues with my camera, so you will only be able to, to hear my voice. Uh, so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to participate in the third Romanian military thinking conference. Um, as you said in your introduction, I'm currently uh, the cyber SME in, a, in, in the, at the NATO Joint, uh, Joint Air Power Competence Center and have participated in various NATO exercises and projects related to integrating cyberspace into operational planning and leveraging future and emerging technologies. Uh, next sli uh, slide, please. Yeah, okay, perfect. I have to start my presentation with a following disclaimer. The Joint Air Power Competence Center was established in 2005 and is the first NATO accredited center of excellence. To this date remains NATO's most important air warfare center. Subsidy's mission is to provide subject matter expertise across a broad range of joint air spa space power topics and to suggest to key decision makers effective solutions. CAPCC is not part of the NATO command structure and offers independent objective military advice to NATO and national institutes. Therefore, this briefing does not represent NATO's official position. Next slide, please. The aim of my presentation is to provide a, a solid understanding of the key concepts and close relationship between the cyberspace domain and the emerging and disruptive technologies 
in planning and conducting future military joint operations, which we now refer to as Joint All Domain Operations, JADO, specifically to highlight the importance of integrating the most innovative and disruptive technologies, such as artificial intelligence, quantum enabled technologies, machine learning, autonomy, blockchain networks, big data management, and the Internet of Things in the military operations planning process. This new concept incorporates the, massi the massive potential of a truly integrated force and how NATO aspires to conduct future operations. Leveraging those new applications, NATO will be able to strengthen its resilience, enhance its situational awareness, and accelerate its speed of action in the forthcoming complex joint all do domain battlefield. It is important to note that there is no NATO definition for the concept of JADO yet. However, JADCC has proposed an initial definition which encompasses the perspectives from all stakeholders across all domains, and I will continue with this definition in my presentation. It is also very interesting the fact that the NATO Joint All Domain Command and Control concept, JADC2, which is part of the overarching JADO project, has already been tested in the wider Black Sea region. In July 2020, a major JADC2 exercise was performed among some NATO nations, highlighting the importance and particularities of this geostrategic position. The mission occurred in international airspace and waters and included training scenarios to integrate, operate and communicate while executing all domain operations. Next slide, please. Cyberspace is a global domain consisting of all interconnected communications, information technology and electronic systems, networks and their data. It is a man-made domain, constantly changing and without physical restrictions. Therefore, it is considered as a fluid, highly contested, congested, cluttered, connected and constrained environment. Its complexity affects every layer of our society. Freedom of action in cyberspace is as important for the military success as control over land, sea, air or space. Cyberspace has been characterized as an embedded domain. Uh, okay, uh, so, um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I skipped, I skipped uh, one, uh, my slide. Um, based on the agenda, uh, which I will cover. Yeah, exactly, this is the correct uh, slide. Cyberspace has been characterized as an embedded domain because cyberspace affects all other domains cannot be completely integrated into another domain. No future war will be fought without cyber operations. Existing international law applies also for cyberspace, and speed is also very critical in this domain. The cyber threat landscape is evolving with tremendous speed, bringing new vulnerabilities and challenges to the surface. Billions of connected Internet of Things devices have a large the attack surface with a diversity of attack vectors. Hence, cyber attacks can be almost instantaneous, global, asymmetric, invisible, and catastrophic without ever reaching the threshold of an armed attack. Next slide, please. NATO recognized cyberspace as a domain of operations in the Warsaw Summit in 2016 acknowledging that cyber attacks present a clear challenge to the security of the Alliance and could be as harmful, as harmful as conventional attacks. Therefore, the Alliance must defend itself as effectively as it does in the air, land, sea and space domain. During the Brussels Summit in 2018, NATO agreed on how to integrate sovereign cyber effects provided voluntarily by Allies, SKEPVA, into alliance operations and missions. That means that commanders may request the ability to create an effect in or through cyberspace, and NATO will ask the nations if they are willing to produce it. Moreover, the Alliance established a Cyberspace Operations Center, SIOP, in shape, 
to act as its key strategic and operational cyber set nexus. The aim of NATO's theater component for cyberspace is to provide situational awareness, mission assurance, and act as the focal po point for cyberspace operations. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability are the principles which form the cornerstone also for NATO's security infrastructure. Recognizing cyberspace as a domain of operations necessitates an operational shift to a focus on mission assurance, a process that ensures that continued the continued function and the resilience of all NATO capabilities and assets, including personnel, equipment, facilities, supply chains, networks and information systems critical to the execution of mission essential functions in any operating environment. NATO Cyber Mission Assurance focuses on threats resulting from our alliance, alliance's extreme reliance on information technology. Next slide, please. Cyberspace has some unique characteristics which differentiate it from the other domains. Not only is it man-made and partially non-physical domain, but also low-cost capabilities and minimum resource requirements can result in disproportionate impact due to the interconnected, ubiquitous nature of cyberspace. Attribution is difficult given the various methods and techniques that are available to disqueeze activities in and through cyberspace and actually protecting the anonymity of the perpetrators. It has no time or geographic dependencies. The cyberspace key terrain changes continually as data are in constant flow. There is no guaranteed control of activity due to the complexity of the attack vectors. No offensive or defensive cyber actions and capabilities remain forever effective, and thus no advantage is permanent. And finally, no nation can claim sovereignty over cyberspace. Next slide, please. The above features create several challenges to integrate cyberspace in operational planning. A wide variety of parties are active in cyberspace, like nation states, non-state actors, cyber terrorists, cyber criminals, hacktivists, and even insiders, complicating the identification process. It is often difficult to understand when and why malicious activities are conducted in and through cyberspace. The conflict between time-consuming preparations and desired effects, especially for tailored cyber weapons, is also a big challenge. The rapidly changing threat landscape and the fact that most of the attacks have hardly any visibility is also challenging. An adversary can achieve effects just by using data exfiltration techniques without being traceable. The main goals when executing cyberspace operations are to preserve friendly freedom of maneuver in cyberspace and to create effects to achieve the commander's objective. In contrast with the operations in other domains, the cyberspace operations can be conducted also in peacetime, not only in armed conflict. Cyberspace operations require extensive preparation prior to starting military mission planning. Next slide, please. The planning and execution of cyberspace operations and their integration into the NATO Comprehensive Operations Planning Directive, COPD, projected the difficulties and exposed the potential vulnerabilities of the old, traditional, incompatible domain-specific approach. As the NATO Alliance is facing threats and challenges from multiple directions, from state and non-state actors, hybrid and non-hybrid, often simultaneously across physical and virtual domains, it is important to reconsider NATO's operational planning approach through all domains. The joint all-domain operations concept introduces new ways of thinking which are more agile, flexible and responsive in order to counter the new challenges. Future conflicts will require decisions to be made within hours or minutes compared with the current multi-day process to analyze the operating environment. The existing command and control architecture is not sufficient to meet these demands anymore. 
the related new advanced command and control systems must be able to connect, integrate, and synchronize forces regardless of their service or domain affiliation. Access to information will be critical in the future joint operating, operating environment. NATO needs to develop new strategies based on the emergent and disruptive technologies that will enable commanders to make better decisions by collecting data from numerous sensors and processing the data using artificial intelligence algorithms in both the tactical and operational level. AI can support the whole planning cycle and the risk assessment process from a high-level approach, while simultaneously can identify targets and recommend optimal weapons, either kinetic or non-kinetic, to engage targets from a low tactical level approach. Finally, the interoperability must be also ensured and enhanced within the Alliance in order to operate effectively and support its three core tasks, collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. Next slide, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, from what we have seen, the Alliance cannot succeed in tomorrow's fight with yesterday's approach and therefore has to adapt to the modern, widened battle space. Speed plays the most important role today. The adversaries are fine-tuning their ability to win quick, decisive engagements. Therefore, NATO must transform and constantly speed up its current operations planning process. A revised and holistic approach to command and control based on all domain ontology from planning to execution needs to be developed. Technology is the fundamental enabler for NATO superiority. No intelligence and situational awareness is possible without the contribution of modernized methods. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, quantum computing, and 5G technologies are very needed for collecting and processing data. The increasing volume of data brings increased need for computerized analytical support in order to detect classify, identify, categorize, and distribute the relevant data. Only a cloud-like environment can support effectively ISR data sharing to enable faster decision-making. Next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation, and I would like to thank you very much for your attention, even without the camera. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Major Canalos, for a very uh, informative and provocative uh, presentation and uh, sharing with us your thoughts on uh, this very uh, very important issue. And um, I hope they should uh, generate vivid discussion in the Q&A session. Now uh, I'm uh, looking for the next uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Georgescu, Alexander Georgescu, uh, who is going to talk about uh, uh, who, who is going to uh, talk about transatlantic cooperation on emerging technologies, new perspectives, and old problems. Uh, Dr. Georgescu is an expert with the Department of Cybersecurity and Critical Infrastructure Protection of the National Institute for Research and Development in Informatics. Has an eclectic background, having studied economics, then geopolitics, and has obtained a PhD in risk engineering for critical infrastructure systems. He's actively involved in advancing uh, critical infrastructure protection and resilience issues uh, through cooperation at international level and has worked on international projects for the European Space Agency, the Shanghai Institutes for Industrial International Studies and others. He is also affiliated with the European Center for Excellence for Blockchain with the Romanian Association for Space Technology and Industry the EURISC Foundation and EUR Defense. Coupled with significant international exposure, he is emerging as a notable member of a new generation of Romanian uh, security experts. 
<coughs> Dr. Ceausescu, please uh, enlighten us uh, with your thoughts and uh, take the floor. You are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have started my webcam. Uh, I, I don't suppose I control the the slides. I don't. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I want to start this presentation with the idea that China has already become the largest filer of patents in the world. So there is a technological competition. This was from the Strategic Trends 2020 report. I would like to talk to you today about the emerging transatlantic. Actually, it's pretty old, but we keep trying to fix it and make it better. The transatlantic cooperation on, um, on uh, emerging technologies. And uh, what I am going to show you today is from a report um, made by a, a study made by a group to which I belong for the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which will appear by the end of the year. So uh, the conclusions from this report are from the technological portion of the uh, cooperation portion of that study on transatlantic cooperation and Romania's contributions to it. And I was the one who uh, coordinated the technological section. Next slide, please. So the evolution of the technological environment has been very, very rapid. We have an intersection between diverse disciplines and domains. And today we cannot simply discuss uh, technological cooperation. We need to unite the transatlantic cooperation policies in trade, in technology, in security, in regulation and standardization, because you cannot treat them separately, even though some interest groups and actors want to do it in this way. And the emerging consensus is that all of these are tied to each other. So we have a role of emerging technologies and digitalization and digitization. So we have uh, new efficiencies, we have new capabilities for defense, for attack, but also new risks, vulnerabilities and threats in the new security environment. And we have discovered recently, also with the pandemic, but before, that uh, it's not sufficient to have research and then to outsource your production to China or to other countries. There is a virtuous cycle between production and innovation and between governance and innovation, because if you do not, uh, if you do not produce, if you do not innovate, you will not be the one who sets standards in the future. And of course, all of us know the dual use nature of emerging technologies and the equalizing leveling function of emerging technologies. China uh, invests in internet, in artificial intelligence and other fields because it uh, it uh, lowers the existing accumulated discrepancies between it and, for instance, the United States, because it is a new field. Please, next slide. Um, the main coordinate of the context of the transatlantic reset, this is what they were calling it, is the growing global competition between the US and China. And uh, this tech, the technological domains that we are discussing, and I'll show you a chart about that, it has a problem, at least from the perspective of smaller actors in Europe. There are concentration effects, like network effects for Facebook, or economies of scale when it comes to manufacturing. This means that technological cooperation, even at transatlantic level, has the tendency to lead to unilateral, bilateral, or minilateral approaches to the detriment of multilateral and collective approaches. So for instance, we have the US plus German relationship, which was extremely strong during the Obama administration. Of course, we have differences at the level of EU and the US. For instance, there was the uh, conflict over the 5G issue and over the Belt and Road Initiative cooperation. Let's not forget how many European countries, including the UK before Brexit and Germany, were founding members of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. We can also see that there has been a recalibration of American priorities after the unipolar moment. So now uh, the United States is trying to spend less on its presence in the world. The, there has been a relative decline of capabilities. It expects its allies to do more. It, uh, America first might have been a slogan for the previous administration, but the new administration is not so different. And uh, of course, 
We also have the first US-EU summit recently after seven years, which created in the field of technology a transatlantic trade and cooperation council, which, for instance, has a working group on artificial intelligence. Uh, but at the same time, we have converging transatlantic perspect uh, perspectives, even with different approaches and tendencies. Next slide. So what are the key challenges here? First, American unpredictability and European disunity. This American tendency that I mentioned before to revert to unilateralism, bilateralism, and minilateralism as a response to European coordination problems. The issues of European strategic autonomy in the context of an asymmetry towards the USA and European strategic autonomy might have begun as a discussion and as a policy with regards to, for instance, defense technology, defense industry, but it has also expanded into uh, emerging technological domains, quantum AI, where there is an increasing tendency towards technological protectionism, which automatically limits the amount of transatlantic cooperation. And um, for instance, various fields have been securitized. So the security component has become so important in their policy that it, uh, uh, that it affects actual exchanges. And the US has done so, for instance, in terms of quantum technologies, where it has become much harder for outside companies, even from the European Union, to invest in that field in the US, to send researchers, to exchange research, to send students, and so on. There are also uh, There is also a lack in the EU of a homogenous perception and perspective on various security and technological issues to inform an EU strategic culture. The Eastern EU members are much more... Uh, are much more open to technological exchanges and cooperation with the US than the Western EU members because of uh, asymmetries in industrial and technological development. Even though they are more, uh, they have a preferential um, security relationship with the US as well. And at the same time, other actors have agency, have will, and are not passively waiting the results of the transatlantic relationship, like China. Next slide, please. Here is an example of European asymmetry in space. Um, you can see how little, even though uh, leaving aside the issue of SpaceX and reusable uh, technology, um, at the same time, there is not that much technological difference between the EU and US, even in capabilities. But you see a huge difference in terms of economic impact. You can see that the EU has fallen, the European countries have fallen behind in the small set revolution, in the micro launcher revolution. They have fallen behind in venture capital in general, but here we can see it in space on the right. So very few venture capitalists investing in the space sector. You can see on the map as well. So this means that Europe has some asymmetries that encourage uh, protectionist approaches. Otherwise, you can find that Europe has a brain drain. You can find that uh, there have been arguments by the Geopolitical Commission that uh, the United States may, for instance, brain drain Europe through strategic investment and acquisitions in European technology companies. And this has happened before. Next slide. There is also the issue of transatlantic digital di distrust. For instance, this is a Munich Security Conference report. It says here, and uh, wait just one second so I can open this so I can see uh, the so I can see the actual uh, figures there. So the share of Europeans who think their country is too dependent on foreign digital technologies, fifty percent agree when it comes to companies from the US. 54% when it comes to country uh, to China, companies from China, or European trust in safety of personal data, distrust of the US government, 55%, distrust of the Chinese government, 70%, distrust of EU government, just 30%. Or uh, how will how will Europe fare in digital technologies? 43% think that Europe will fall behind compared to China and the US. 35% think that Europe will be on par and only 6% think that Europe will take the lead. So the differences in actual perceptions when it comes to the citizen 
is not that different between the US and China when it comes to dependency on technology, even though there has been an effort to try to convince that there is a difference. And this distrust is reflected at the level of the European Parliament, at the level of national parliaments, and will be reflected in policies. And we have seen, for instance, the new, uh, the new, uh, uh, we called it uh, the uh, traffic light coalition, Coalitia Semaphore in Germany, that is very interesting and might uh, give us some surprises in terms of transatlantic cooperation policies, at least the German approach to it. Next slide, please. Ne Okay, so what were the technological domains for cooperation that we had, uh, we highlighted in our study that will appear by the end of next year, by the end of this year? So we focused, even though it's not an emerging technological domain, we said that cybersecurity is extremely important. Digital technologies from them, artificial intelligence, 5G, blockchain, quantum computing, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, but also with regards to foods and so on. Green technology, especially for energy, hydrogen and uh, wind, solar, the technological portions, I mean. Nuclear technology, of course, despite the uh, difficult relationship at the European Union with the level of the European Union with nuclear energy and space technology as well. Next slide. We've seen, for instance, in the field of space technology, not just European strategic autonomy in terms of space technology, where the European Union created the Galileo Global Navigation Satellite System, it created the Copernicus Space Ob um, Earth Observation System, and is now creating, uh, as a result of agreements made during the Romanian presidency of the European Union Council, um, it is also creating the GovSatcom, the Secure Government Satellite Communications Initiative. So European strategic autonomy, but also cooperation, for instance, on Artemis getting to the moon or on um, reducing the hybrid threats to satellites. And what are the key dimensions of a cooperation? Well, the most important dimensions for us are the dimension of supply and production chains, infrastructure, governance and values, ethics, democratic, liberal principles. And we have a chart in our study where we say, for instance, we put the technological domains on one side and the key dimensions above, and then we state which parts are important. For instance, for green technologies and supply and production chains, we have the supply of rare earth metals and so on. Next slide, please. And the technology eventually factors into competition. Now the world is defined by the US-China competition, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a level of EU-US competition. So you have integration in production chains for high technology products, innovation as a source of added value, control influence over standards, regulatory regimes, the omnipresence of dual use considerations, at least somewhere in the production chain. Transformative technologies being there first for widespread use, AI, blockchain, quantum, control over development ecosystems, and competition and cooperation as a natural state of such systems. Your rivals can also be your customers, consumers, partners, and so on. Next slide. Here is an example of emerging US-EU cooperation. So there was first, uh, just because I mentioned how this cooperation has been taking place in the past, but nobody was very happy with it. You had the EU-US Science and Technology Agreement in 1999. So the Trade and Technology Cooperation Council is not something new. You had a high-level regulatory forum starting in 2009, if I am not uh, mistaken, which hasn't met for years. There was a JRC NIST study in 2012, so Joint Research Center of the European Commission and National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, on the benefits of US-European security standardization. Because actually, the main focus of EU-US transatlantic uh, uh, technological cooperation is the fact that they are so similar in perspectives that they have a common interest in global regulation of technology, and they also have the economic power together to try to uh, ensure that the standards are the ones that they prefer, the technological standards that will inform the next generation of technological products, including for security use. 
So in the US, we have a Cyber Diplomacy Act, the Democracy Technology Partnership Act, which, uh, which uh, highlights the importance of cooperation with foreign partners, especially the EU. In the EU, we have the new EU-US Agenda for Global Change. We have the Common Dialogue on Technological Competition initiated during the recent summit. In, U, in U.S. documents of reference, such as its AI strategy, it emphasizes international and especially transatlantic cooperation. Uh, but there are also counterexamples. In the EU, we have the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act, which specifically targeted uh, U.S. companies over use of uh, European citizen data. So there have been a lot of conflicts on the use of uh, EU citizen data, but also conflicts over the uh, taxation of U.S. technology companies, their monopolistic position in the EU markets, and so on. And this is why I say that the new administration is not so different from the old administration because the incentives are largely the same. There has there has been, for instance, an EU 5G security cybersecurity toolbox, just as the U.S. created and promoted its clean network for standards on security of networks and uh, 5G telecommunications and so on. And now the two of them are actually uh, designated together as being synergistic, so they can work together to increase security. Next slide. Just as an example, and this is the final portion of my presentation, of course, uh, there are a few more slides, but I'll just uh, go very briefly through the issue. So we had a 5G spat between the US and the EU in the summer of 2020. You had the uh, Mike Pompeo coming to Europe uh, for meetings and then the Europeans meeting also the Chinese. And then, uh, and then um, I think what was his name, Robert O'Brien, the national security advisor, was coming to Europe and then another meeting with the Chinese of the Europeans. So there was this sort of shuttle diplomacy as they were trying to convince the Europeans to not accept 5G infrastructure cons built by Chinese companies. And in the end, the Americans won out, but it's not a complete victory. There are still reservations on the part of the EU. Next slide. And of course, we know that 5G will be very important in the future. So the key elements that the 5G issue shows us, and this applies also to other technological fields. So first, we have the asymmetric mercantilism practiced by China, where, it's, uh, where it uh, uh, provides financial support for its companies to gain uh, to gain uh, leverage over markets and to have comprehensive partnerships where they provide not only the equipment, but also the financing technology and so on. You have a fusion between economic, technological security, technology, security, diplomacy and intelligence policy. You have high knowledge versus tacit knowledge. This is what happened when, you, when we outsourced to China. We lost a lot of the tacit knowledge the tacit knowledge in technology that led to a lot of incremental innovation. Macroeconomics is becoming an excuse for strategic decoupling. And uh, we have issues of supply chain security, exclusivity, controllability. In the end, especially in China, all strategic companies are de facto state companies. It doesn't matter who actually owns them, whether they are private or state, because ownership and control through regulation are completely different things. Next slide, please. So uh, I want to um, emphasize just this uh, very interesting quote uh, from a U.S. Department of Defense report. It said, it says that the rest of the world will likely be driven to implement the 5G network design and infrastructure of whichever country leads 5G. China is the current leader and U.S. allies have taken different stances on how to respond to the Chinese drive to set 5G standards. And that same report says that, for instance, the, e, the U.S. had the lead in 4G and because it had that lead, it set the standards. And with the standards set, the U.S. technology companies took the lead in 4G and created new companies and so on and ensured 4G supremacy for, for the US. Now they are thinking that China will do the same for 5G and there will be an erosion of strategic industrial capabilities for cyber warfare, high-tech military production, domination of future strategic growth industry and so on. And this presents supply chain risks, national security risks, intelligence sharing risks and so on. Next slide. 
Okay, next slide. Just uh, skip this one. So a lot of unknowns regarding the impact, for instance, of 5G in uh, Chinese 5G infrastructure and Europe. And um, for instance, the Huawei Cybersecurity Evaluation Center in the UK, and there are such bodies also in Australia, Canada, and various European companies, European states, says that overall the oversight board can only provide limited assurance that all risks to UK national security from Huawei's involvement in the UK's critical networks can be sufficiently mitigated long term. Uh, and uh, there is a civil military fusion in China that makes all private enterprise in dual use sectors suspect. There is a blurring of the lines between the core and periphery equipment in 5G networks, especially through software development, virtual infrastructure. So it's not sufficient, as the Europeans were saying in the past, that we could only get the antennas from China because it's peripheral equipment. More and more, there is no distinction. And all strategic companies behave like state-owned companies, including being directed through national policies made in China 2025, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Going Global Initiative, and so on. Next slides. And this is a place where the US, for instance, has fallen behind. So what about the Western competitors? Huawei and ZTE, they hold a combined 41% of overall market share for network infrastructure, followed by Ericsson at 27% and Nokia with 23%. So that's 50% to 41%. That's pretty good. But at the same time, Huawei grew global revenues from approximately 28 billion in 2009 to 107 billion in 2018. Ericsson's revenues during the same period fell from 27.9 billion to 23.9 billion, and Nokia's from 57.6 billion to 26.6 billion. So the capacity of companies to support from without state help to support investment in technology, expansion, and so on, is much more limited. And this is why, for instance, we saw very bizarre uh very bizarre events in the United States, like the national, the Attorney General William Barr during the Trump administration making a case for uh, congressional support of 5G. That was not his job. So it was interesting that various parts of the American um, administration were making similar noises at the time. Next slide. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, yes, just one second. Next slide. So, with regards to warfare, we have uh, this quote, a very interesting quote from Australia, that Huawei is also a major participant in initiatives to develop dual-use technologies that will have significant implications for warfighting, including 5G, quantum cryptography, and artificial intelligence, exactly the technological domains that were highlighted in the digital sphere for transatlantic cooperation. And of course, in the context of hybrid warfare, new generation warfare, uh, asymmetric warfare, whatever you want to call it or whatever perspective you want to approach, this technological uh, competition is becoming more and more important. Uh, for instance, China's 2009 defense white paper only mentions mechanization of forces seven or eight times. Informati informatization is mentioned 50 times. Next slide, please. We're coming up to the end. So the intelligence, next slide, please. Uh, this is very interesting. So from now on, this is um, a, a CEO from China said that from now on, uh, you will have a party committee within your company. There will be a form of mixed ownership for state investors and you can receive massive support, but it will be very painful if you refuse. And Robert Strayer, the chief U.S. cyber diplomat, said that if other countries insert and allow untrusted vendors to build out and become the vendors for their 5G networks, we will have to reassess the ability for us to share information and be connected with them in the ways that we are today. And uh, from the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, both the human and technical reach of Chinese companies now give the intelligence services opportunities to gain direct access to many governments within the developing world, as well as many allied and European countries. 
this is very interesting because um, now NATO is trying to evolve towards even greater intelligence sharing. And intelligence sharing, because of the lack of trust, has always been a very huge problem. This is why the greatest intelligence sharing arrangement in the world is the Five Eyes, where the states have direct access to each other's intelligence as opposed to going through a process and the hierarchy to obtain intelligence. Next slide. And the, the lack of trust um, for instance, in networks, next slide, will affect that capacity to share intelligence. Whereas I mentioned the difficulties of, uh, of uh, European companies such as, uh, such as uh, um, of companies such as Ericsson and Nokia. At the same time, there is a $77 billion line of credit from the China Development Bank for Huawei to, be, to uh, invest in the infrastructure, to finance the infrastructure of its uh, customers at national level. And of course, we have here other examples. And from the US, we have this uh, conclusion uh, from a, uh, actually, yes, from a Department of Defense report. These efforts will allow China to promote its preferred standards and specifications for 5G networks and will shape the global 5G product market going forward. This is why the transatlantic cooperation on 5G, but also on the other examples that I couldn't cover here, the other, the other domains is so important. Next slide, please. And lastly, this is the final slide, I promise. Uh, the battle over standardization. You can see here in the International Standards Organization on the right, so blue uh, is the number of secretariats, working groups, and so on led by China in 2011, and uh, orange is the number led in 2018. So standards has, uh, have become an issue of diplomacy. The regulators are the new diplomats, according to Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was in the Obama Department of State, in the Clinton Department of State, I mean, during the Obama administration. So regulators are the new diplomats. There is an increasing emphasis on cooperation, not just for normal regulation like health and safety, but also for technology. And it is a legitimate area of conflict and competition. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I'm at your disposal for any questions. So this uh, is thank you. that will appear by the end of the year. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Doctor. Uh, and uh, yes, it's a shame we don't have enough time to get into uh, your uh, very provocative and interesting uh, insights. Uh, we appreciate very much your contribution, and I hope during the Q and A we we'll, we'll, uh, could expand some of them. Uh, now uh, we are moving, uh, uh, it seems that uh, Dr. Merker uh, joined us in the meantime, and uh, Dr. Merker, are you available for us? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, so uh, again, just a short introduction, uh, uh, thank you very much, you are very welcome, sir. Uh, Dr. Greg Melker is the Chief Operation Officer for the New Generation Warfare Center. Uh, uh, he's also affiliated with the Virginia Tech Applied Research Corporation and the Alien Science and Technology. He was a senior fellow at the Potomac Foundation and recently graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a Master's in Global Policy. In a prior position, he was a vice president leading national security analysis at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, where he substantially grew their portfolio in modeling, simulation, and analysis for U.S. Department of Defense and Homeland Security clients. He also established and led their efforts to counter China's anti-access area denial and the Russian strategic initiative. Uh, Dr. Melker, thanks again for uh, having time to join us and uh, please uh, uh, share with us your views uh, and uh, you can start your intervention. Uh, please take the floor. Uh, good morning, Colonel. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, uh, my apologies. I, all week long I've been in different time zones as the meetings that I was in and I messed this one up. <laughs> I was all, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, thank you very much for the intro, and uh, let me get started. Uh, uh, can you go to the next sli slide, please? 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is give you some a little of the background of how I come at the problems that we're talking about today from work in Europe and how that applies to the military. Um, and I took a tact of uh, paying attention to AI in particular and what the applications of how that then links in with cyber. Uh, a little bit on how some of our threat as our adversaries are looking at autonomy and AI. If you saw my partner, Dr. Peterson's presentation yesterday, uh, he's going to take that and go in more depth, much more depth in terms of where Russia is on autonomy. And that'll be part of a presentation he'll give at the uh, Unmanned Systems Conference that New Strategy Center has planned for February. Anyways, I've abstracted a little bit of that to kind of make some points here. And then I want to talk in the end wep about weaponization of information and, and cognitive warfare. Uh, next slide, please. So my center basically looks at three things. One, we, we study and research the evolving use of new generation warfare techniques. And I'll show you what that is in a second, at least the definition that we use right now. Second, we've created a number of uh, you know, uh, dialogues and places to get senior military and civilian leadership to talk about key issues. And I think that's important, particularly on the um, Eastern front of NATO, where not, not all the countries are in NATO. Some are in the EU and some are just partner nations. And we try to pull them all together on a periodic basis in a, an environment where they can interact. So a little bit different than something like this, where everyone gives their talk and maybe there's a little Q&A at the end. This is a case where the senior leaders sit around the table for uh, two or three days together and, uh, and go through a variety of issues. And then last, most of our, our primary bread and butter is what we call experiential learning. It's operational strategic level simulations and exercises all on the eastern flank. Uh, and that's a whole range of different things. It can be very strategic and, or even sometimes getting down to the tactical level. And I'll explain that evolution in a minute, which kind of is my motivation for leaning into this particular topic. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are the nine elements of new generation warfare and this came out from a couple of kernels back in 2013 we haven't seen much of it from russia since then so it could have been they don't really follow this it could have been they're using it and they just keep it classified it could be that it's evolved i would imagine it's evolved quite a bit but i kind of group it in three areas there's the classic what i call non-kinetic activity at the top some people call it hybrid warfare regular warfare gray zone there's a lot of different names for it uh, so pick the one you like, but that's what this is sort of what we're talking about at the top. You know, it's the, the non-military, the intimidation, fraud, bribery, things like that. All the kinds of malign influence destabilization operations. And certainly in Romania, you've seen a lot of that around the virus uh, leading to the problems that you've had lately. Now, it's not homegrown. Uh, your friends to the East helped you, helped quite a bit in getting you into that position. Uh, then there's getting more into the classic... Uh, military use including regular warfare that we think of today whether it's the type of insurgent things we've done for 20 or 30 years in the middle east or if it's the high-end warfare we've seen just recently in the donbass and then third the third element or kind of category is nuclear weapons uh you know it's whether you you know blow up a nuclear power plant or or chemical facilities or you consider the the reality that the russians have considered their research in uh, uh, partial fusion fraction non-strategic nuclear weapons, and they practice and use them on the battlefield all the time. It was all over Zappa 21. Uh, and so that, that's a clear use. And the, the difference between them and all the efforts in the U.S. to catch up, for example, is that we have stopped doing research on our development of our warheads. And so while we might be able to make them smaller, their, ours will be dirty. Theirs will not. Theirs will have low signatures when it comes to things like radiation and things like that. Uh, so they can use a small one where it's uh, uh, not uh, not as uh, it's not like a, it's going to uh, uh, do a kind of a meltdown like in Chernobyl. And it's important to understand that the, you can employ uh, these in any order or combination. They are not an escalation ladder that they will pick. Uh, the general staff will pick whatever it is they need to, to accomplish the mission. Um, and then I think for this audience, it's important to, to realize that this doesn't really specifically get at things like cyber and, and AI or information warfare, or what I'll talk about later, cognitive warfare. But I kind of see those as back planes that cross all of these elements. Next slide, please. So we've been doing our simulations and studies and analysis along the whole front here. We've, we've been involved in the high north as far as Svalbard. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Sweden. Uh, uh, we have a contract with the, the Swedish Defense University, which allows us to do some work for their military. 
and interacting with other Nordic states. So a lot of focus then in the Baltic region, uh, Poland and, and the uh, Baltic states and the classic conflict that's had the uh, measures, the enhanced force protection measures that have been put in place up there by NATO and a lot of activities and, and so on. And now down to Romania's region in the Black Sea where it's the tailored process and then down into the Eastern Med. So we've done work across all of these areas, uh, different simulations and games of many different types. And I, I think it helps us to get a, a, a bigger perspective. So that's kind of how I come in at all, at all, looking at it from this long, long, what I call the long front with Russia, as opposed to say back in the Cold War, where it was a, a fairly short inter-German border between the, the Soviet Union, Warsaw Pact, and the, and the Western NATO countries. So it's a different, it's a different problem, a different challenge. And now that Russia has shown its true nature over the last uh, six or seven years after the Donbass and Crimea, it's, I think it's a whole different challenge that we haven't quite got our arms around. But at least people are moving in that direction and working on it. Next slide. So that's led to sort some of an evolution in terms of simulation and wargaming. You know, initially we focused on classic kinetic force-on-force -force military warfare, things which would call, require a calling in Article Five, and the NATO, the NAC committee would meet at NATO and vote on it, and and the war would go on from there. And generally, a high-end warfare, you know, kind of like we talked about, I mentioned in the Donbas, where it's tanks and artillery and that sort of thing. But as we did it and we looked at what happened in the Donbass and other places, we knew we had to evolve that to what we called full, full spectrum deterrence. And so that means in any simulation, conflict begins in non-kinetic sphere. And again, those terms, hybrid or regular, whatever you want to call it. And, and there's quite a bit of that goes on, and then it goes kinetic. However, the non-kinetic activities, those hybrid or regular type activities continue. You saw in the Donbass, in the middle of a fire strike, uh, people are there were at, at the front, uh, uh, um, excuse me, Ukrainians with cell phones were getting personalized calls from from Russians telling them about problems back home. And why don't you go back to the uh, why don't you go back to back home and, and uh, Kiev and deal with these issues? Don't be on the front here fighting us. Uh, it's amazing some of the things that happen. Uh, he's now a colleague of Virginia Tech, a guy named Brantley was at the uh, he has some associations with Ukraine, and he was at the War College at the time. He wrote a very interesting study where he dealt with all these cyber and EW issues that went on during, during the conflict. Uh, but now we take the next evolution, realizing that the war itself may be fully conducted in the information and cognitive space. And these are things, Article 3 and 4, uh, below, below Article 5, where, where it may never get to shooting a gun. And, uh, you know, you've seen it in Crimea. Essentially, Russia won a war in Crimea, and they didn't fire a shot. And so we can see that going on. And I think we're at war in many other cases and many other places than what, than what uh, their uh, groups from the Internet Research Agency and GRU have been doing uh, to the U.S. and Western European countries. So this all leads to be a challenge to simulate and game these non-kinetics and how does AI and cyber fit into it. And I'm not saying I have answers to that. I just know that that's a problem that I've been trying to work on to figure out how to do it. Similarly, the players in any kind of thing like this, you know, it used to be just the military. I usually engage with a J5 of a, of a Ministry of Defense, and that would be the people that would pull together for us to do uh, uh, some sort of simulation or war game. Uh, but then we realized that, well, you can't really do it with that because all kinds of responsibilities for these threats are lie in, the, in what Romania calls interinstitutional organizations or others, other countries tend to call interagencies. Um, and, and the focus on using the whole of government. But even then, that's not enough. Uh, for many of these activities, it really requires total society resilience. And you have to pull in your industry. And if you don't, you're still going to lose. And I have to say that I've not yet gotten to the point where I've gotten that a full, what I consider a full up round of participants in a simulation that not only come from all the right organizations need to come from, but they're also able to adequately address all the elements of what is involved in an attack. At one of these dialogues, I turned to two chads, I won't say which ones they were, and I said, you know, if it's a military conflict that's in Article 5, we know who's in charge and whose job it is. And that's you, it's you two. But all these other things on this chart, whose job is it? Who's in charge? Who's got the lead? That's very, very unclear. And certainly the uh, civilian and, and, uh, and industry size of it don't necessarily see themselves as part of a, uh, a, a response to a conflict or a war that is existing in a cognitive zone. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to move more towards the topic at hand. I thought it would be good to go over what our National Commission on, on AI recommended. This, uh, this came out uh, earlier in 2021, I believe. 
uh, some very uh, senior people, some very smart people on it. Um, I'd say not necessarily all, all senior, but very smart. And I should note that uh, I mean I focus on this one because it came out of the U.S. and I know and I know it better and I actually read most of it and it's like 750 pages. But you get most of it by just reading the executive summary. Uh, but there's also uh, a bunch of other studies out there. There's one done by the U.K. Uh, there's one done by the EU. There's one done by IARPA, which is the kind of Homeland Security Advanced Research Projects Agency for the United States. There's quite a few. Now, I haven't sat down side by side, and there's probably more kernels I would find if I looked at the rest of these, but I'm going to stick to this one, uh, given the limited time I had to think about this. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, they make the point that AI really is different. This is something different than anything else we've been. It's not, elect it's not discovering electricity. This is truly going to be world altering in what it does in a way that nothing else that's come forward ha has presented itself. And you know this idea of a machine that can perceive a value and act more quickly, more quickly and accurately than a human, that's going to give whoever's got it a huge competitive advantage. If you're if you're going, and I'll, I'll say this probably five times in this presentation. If you're trying to, if you have a threat that's operating at machine speed and you're going to try and do it with a human in the loop, you're going to lose. Uh, that's a, that's a huge problem. Uh, and then uh, you know we just talked. I just heard in the last presentation talking about where we stand at 5G, and that's true. The technological predominance is under threat to China and in some cases Russia. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about Russia. I know a lot about China, but I haven't really looked at it too much in the last five or six years. Look more at Russia, so I'll, I'll show some examples there of what they're up to. Uh, but I think one thing to, to look at this is, is it's, it's, it's important to, to pry, the, the, uh, pry things up and dig a little bit deeper. And there's a think tank in the US called CNAS and they've done, they have a guy who's done, Paul Shears, I think his name, and he's done some very deep work into the technology. And I was reading through one of his reports, and uh, he was able to show in that report that, in fact, the advancement of 5G and AI technologies, for the most part, is actually all still in the U.S. ballet. It's the U.S. researchers are doing it all. The problem is, is that back in the 90s, the U.S. sold off its production and factories and globalization, thinking that that would be just fine and we keep the technology. And we're realizing that's not true. So what China is better at isn't so much the, tech, the leading edge of technology, it's being able to turn it into a product in a market and move forward. We're not as good at it in the US. We've lost our self, and I, and I, and I lay that on the, on the bottom of globalization where we move factories and other production capabilities out and broke, broke the connection. And also, as I, I think you may have mentioned the, the prior speaker, that you know, the, the mix, the military uh, and, and civilian mix where it's all together in China in a way that doesn't happen in the U.S. It would be illegal and we wouldn't let uh, our military officers be in business for themselves the way they, they do in China. Um, so AI is deepening the threat posed by cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns, their ability to infiltrate our society, steal our data, interfere in our democracy. And these are just limited attacks to date. They're just the tip of the iceberg. We're just beginning to see the deep fake, the deep fake uh, revolution that I think is going to come to the point where it's going to be very difficult. Uh, you know, I, I pride myself on never clicking on that link. But man, uh, even now I'm starting to get things in, in my, email, my inbox where I, I've almost gotten tricked twice in just the last week of clicking on a link. And it's only going to get worse. And finally, this study made clear we are not organized to win. And I'm sorry to say that I haven't seen a whole lot of action yet that, to really make a difference at the level that the report recommends. Uh, I have one more slide on this. Next slide, please. Um, so as I, met, I said before, defense against AI adversaries operating in this machine change will require that you do the same thing. You've got to be employing a similar capability. If, you know, human, human operators just can't keep up, and you know whether that's cyber, disinformation, drones, or missiles across the board. You will not be able to keep up if, if you aren't trying to match it. So that's why it's so critical. And whoever, whoever has the upper hand here is going to win. Um, and using a lot of this stuff, we know that there's been a lot of harvesting of data, particularly from China, from the West. Now, a lot of that was built on technology theft. But now it's beginning to be used for tailored attempts to manipulate or coerce individuals. And in addition, in, in to really use effective AI, you need a huge data set. So when they download and steal the whole uh, health records of all of the Americans, that gives them a lot of advantages and things they can do in terms of this exploitation as well as tailor their AIs to be able to leverage that knowledge and information. Um, we're going to have to be, we're going to have to really pull AI into cyber defense because the attackers are going to have it and the defenders are going to have it. And I've got a chart on that based on my discussions actually with a Romanian, uh, a Romanian uh, cyber AI firm. 
Um, now, the West is going to develop these AI-enabled lethal weapons with consideration of law and ethics. I I'm absolutely sure of that. There'll be a lot of debates, a lot of discussions, and we'll do a lot of outreach to China and Russia, and they'll give a lot of lip service of how, yeah, they're going to follow all that. But let's face it, they're not. They're, they're going full speed ahead. Ethics is not on the list when, when the Russians are doing this, and I doubt it will be on China's either. So that's something we have to keep in consideration, that we have to re be responsible to our, our politicians and the rule of law and right and wrong, and uh, the, the enemy will not. So we're going to have to find a way to be more adaptive than they are. And the last thing that I think was important to this conversation is the need to scale up the digital talent in government and win the talent competition and establish the AI infrastructure. And again, I don't, I don't really find U.S. efforts all that satisfactory. I think in Romania in particular, uh, you've got quite a hub of IT capability up in Cluj, and that may be something that can be built on and, and nourished and moved in this direction. And something like this, which is new and evolving, it's easy. You don't have to you know, spend 30 years trying to get caught up. You can jump right to the front of the line with the right people with the right education and, and, build, that, and build those people at scale. Okay, next slide. So uh, I pulled this out of a study. By the way, there's probably lots of attribution in this brief that I didn't make. I just don't have time to do it. So uh, this is, uh, I apologize to anybody if I'm using their stuff. But uh, these are basic uh, studies, I've, some interesting studies I found looking around the internet and people sent to me. So there's a lot of applications. This came up one particular study. It just kind of showed the ranges of areas that it can be applied from big data to logistics to robots, cybersecurity underwater mines and, and, and objects location, things like that. And there's a lot of things and, and all those green boxes to the right. Uh, don't ask me questions about that. I know a little bit about them, but not probably not enough to say too much more. But I think we'll I'll, I'll touch in this brief a little bit more on logistics, uh, cyber and cybersecurity in particular. Next slide. So there are challenges, though, to employ AI. There's been a lot of AI breakthroughs in, in, in the commercial world, commuter uh, vision, uh, neuro linguistics programming, robotics, data mining, lots of things you can do there. Virginia Tech, we did all kinds of very interesting data mining with, uh, with, mach with machine learning tools and things like that that would allow you to do things that you never did before. You know, just things like even trying to find the right researcher and the right, you know, who's the most qualified. There's a lot of interesting things you can do there, which can be applied either military or civilian. Most of these things are done for civilian. Then we just saw a bunch of potential military applications, whether it's intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, command and control, cyber, underwater, underwater mine warfare was an example, training and education and so on. But there's a lot of challenges to this. Um, you know, in order to gain decision maker trust and believe in the AI and do the right risk analysis, it has to be relatively transparent. And typically it's more of a black box where it's not something you can get your hands around and that's gonna be a dilemma. Uh, particularly if you have to worry about ethics and you have to worry about, you know, the, the use of legal weapons. Is the human in the loop? Is the machine making the decision? Is the human or what's going to happen there? And you're going to face weapons from the other side, I think, where the human is not in the loop. The machine is going to be deciding it. Um, things need to be robust and reliable, but uh, it's very easy to manipulate AI. By, by some minor changes in the data, you can make a big difference. And sometimes it's not detectable. Uh, it's often like having a, a little malign uh, piece of code in a, in a chip or in a large piece of software. It's almost impossible to find it. Um, and again, I think I mentioned earlier about the de dependence on a large amount of training data, or, excuse me, a large amount of, of data in general. And uh, military applications often lack that. And so that's why uh, the Jake is the one effort in DOD. It's called a joint uh, AI, AI office or committee or something like that. Anyway, it's an, it's an office uh, dedicated to advancing AI applications across the U.S. Department of Defense. And so the first areas they were able to make any progress were in the area of maintenance and, and uh, readiness improvements because they had a lot of data. I once led readiness for the U.S. Navy, so I, I can tell you uh, uh, I employed, uh, I think, half a dozen Ph.D. economists from the Center for Naval Analysis to help it do it because there's so much data, so much rich data to deal with when you're tracking readiness and, you know, you know, how many flying hours were used, how much maintenance, how much was spent, and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of good data to operate on. So it's certainly an area where AI can go right to the head of the queue and making a difference. Again, data is, the data is critical. Uh, next slide. So uh, our, our Department of Defense has a, de a Defense Information Systems Agency that basically owns and runs most of the networks. Not all of them, but most of them, and it's a huge amount. Of, and um, they do plan to strategic employ AI capabilities for defensive cyber operations. Um, the threat's never been higher. As they say, malware has become organized crime on an international scale. 
uh, AI and machine learning for cyber defense allows more real-time visibility of network attacks. And I, I think it's almost, you have to use it. If their network, the size of the network is so large, there's so many endpoints, it's just not possible to manage it manually. So they've got a bunch of pilot efforts underway. They're teaming with that joint AI center I mentioned uh, on the last slide. And then anyway, their goal is to get automation AI tools in the hands of their analysts. So when they've got a whole range of threats, they're able to prioritize and, and, and pay attention to the most important ones, the ones that are most critical. And I think they're gonna need uh, AI enabled tools in order to defend against all these cyber things that, are, <clears throat> that they've been dealing with over the last couple of years. And it's only getting worse in many areas, as you know. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so this is this comes from my uh, discussion with a firm here in Romania, the Cyber Dashians. They they have a new uh, company. I'm sorry, they're going to be mad at me. I can't remember their name, but anyway, uh, uh, but I've been talking a lot with them about uh, how do we simulate uh, cyber at the kind of the operational level. I mean, we know we know in a game how to kind of say, okay, there was a cyber attack at the strategic level. We can talk about it and what was the effect, but it's all just words. It's not really there's no quantitative thinking to it, and we know how to have a real cyber war game where people are down at the bit level uh doing real attacks and simulating attacks and things like that but then it's a bunch of people that are you know in, in the computer level and it's it's not really for the operational strategic level so i'm trying to figure out a way to get in the middle and they've been helping me think about that but uh looking at what they're going is there is that they're saying you know the new generation of complex cyber attacks will be using ai to, to exploit system vulnerabilities so today's defense basically either use the current attack tools, which are kind of more manual and guided by operators or, or simulations that are not a real attack. So in the future, I think cyber defense tools must use the offense attack model of one's own system to reveal vulnerabilities in house. So what I'm saying is that, you know, what I, what I learned, you know, I've spent time in, in national security agency and our cyber command, command and places like that. And the one thing I've come away with is the offense is always better than the defense. And it's not just because it's easier. It's because the, the smarter people like to do offense and that's where they go. So the real brilliant brains, that's where they are. So if you really want to defend yourself, you're going to have to use AI enabled cyber attack tools to attack yourself. You're going to have to hire somebody that attacks yourself on a daily, 24-7, uh, all the time, constantly digging into your system, trying to find the vulnerabilities and fixing it in real time. Because if you don't do it, the adversary will, and then they'll be exfiltrating your data or stealing your thing or giving you a ransomware attack or something like that. So using the latest <clears throat> big data models and deep learning AI that allow you to more or less automate this adversarial simulation process. And again, you know, offense is always better than defense. So essentially, I think the, the approach of the future will be, everybody will be where they're attacking themselves and using that, that AI approach uh, to figure out where their vulnerabilities are and then make quick patches and improvements over time. So I think that's where this is all gonna be headed in the future. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted to stop and turn a little bit and talk about uh, our adversary in Russia, at least one adversary, um, and what they've been up to. So these are all pictures from Zapid 21 that just happened a month or so ago. And these are some of their autonomous capabilities that were all practiced. They had, uh, they had uh, you know, reconnaissance version, combat versions, uh, uh, operational military uh, offensive capabilities, anti-air, anti-tank. And that's a BMP3 on the left, which will uh, lower left, which will serve as a platform for many of their future unmanned systems. And all of these, they have multiple efforts to develop AI to help command these vehicles so they can operate autonomously without direction and control. And also means that if they had to, they can break the link. So they're not no longer controlling it. And of course, there's no ethics review panel in Russia over this use. And so uh, what I want to get across here is just imagine facing an army of these operating autonomously where they, they are already programmed to fight and do, and do their mission. The AI gets better and better over time. I mean, it's not hard to see that this is the beginning. You know, if you think of the Terminator movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you remember when he showed the picture of the future and the battlefield with all the uh, machines that were uh, attacking the world and things like that, um, you know, this is the start of heading in that direction. And that's a, that's a vision that we should have in our heads. And I hope it scares people a little bit because it, it's an important uh, message to get of what the potential of this could be, particularly as you enable them with AI. And think about it, if they're really autonomous and the link is cut, then how do you get in? I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. How do you get in to do something about it? How do you stop them short of a kinetic way? Is there a way to do it in AI? Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is the uh, uh, big uh, tank facility there in Russia that Putin's visiting. Uh, and that this is where they're going to make their heavy unmanned ground vehicles, uh, ultimately to replace Russian tanks and armored vehicles. So right now it's just a complementary experiment, uh, experimental role. Uh, eventually they, they uh, see it as an alternating role and eventually a prominent role. And frankly, and, and I'm just showing you the ground role. There's the same process underway in air and maritime. Uh, we just haven't enough time to dig through what we saw in Zapper 21 to show all of that. So I think it's critical to develop a way to cyber attack the AI on these things. And how do you do that? How do you get inside their AI? How are you going to how are you going to be able to get to it? You know, now now you you know you can use electronic warfare, you can attack the command and control system and things like that. But what happens when the AI gets good enough that these things can fight autonomously? They gave it a command at the start and then they break the link and it's on its own. Uh, then uh, then how do you stop it at that point? That's a, that's a thing we have to think about. And as we build our own AI and as we do our own cyber AI attempts to penetrate their systems, and uh, we have to keep that in mind that our ability to reach out and be able to stop one of these in the future may be dependent on some techniques or some ideas that come in that area. Of course, that's going to get all highly classified, so that's probably about all we can say about it here. Next slide. Okay, and then last, um, I just want to mention that they've taken uh, the recommendations from that U.S. National Security Commission on AI I mentioned about the need to develop the technology complex and pull people together to be able to address this future of both AI and robotic and unmanned capabilities, and they've established a whole new complex. And frankly, it's right on the Black Sea in a town called ANAPA. I don't, I don't know where it is. I guess over there near Sochi or something like that. And eventually this will have about 18 laboratories and 2,000 scientists. And this is their kind of response to try and getting back into the game and compete with, uh, with China, with AI and, and uh, 5G and things like that. But of course, in their case, most of these applications are headed to the military. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna turn corners a little bit again. So I, I wanna finish up. I've got, I think, three more slides. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about kinetic versus non-kinetic, moving really fully over into that non-kinetic sphere where the war is fought in the without really any shooting. Um, you know, one thing we've seen is we look through and how did, how did things like Brexit happen? How did, how were our elections influenced in the U.S.? How did Russia try and you know what did they spend? I think Russia spent about twenty million dollars, and they almost put Le Pen in in control in France a few years ago. So it's not that expensive to do these things. So greed and corruption make liberal societies very vulnerable to Russian new generation warfare techniques. Um, they've, they've helped the mobilized minorities to insist on the right to defy the majority. And this chaos will permit Russian kinetics to prevail um, if it's that. And of course, on our side in the U.S., um, you know, they're, they're trying to put, they're essentially trying to create a situation where we, we will have a civil war. And we have uh, people talking about sedition. We have people talking about withdrawing, senators talking about withdrawing their state from the U.S. and things like that. Um, it's, it's, it's getting pretty bad. And I know that, um, you know, I see the, the malign influence reports in Romania. I know these things go on frequently uh, in Romania as well. Uh, and then if the majority begins to feel their liberal are being denied political equality and social justice, you know, as you see in a system in the U.S., uh, you can be elected president without winning the majority of the vote. And there's reasons for that. But, you know, if it gets too far out of, out of whack and it gets too far manipulated, then, then it gets to be a problem. And if the collective defense of international norms are denied, then no amount of kinetic warfare capabilities be sufficient to bring strategic stability and security to liberal democracies. And uh, as I mentioned, talking about this, there's a lot of sad examples uh, in Romania and in America for this. And we've seen it in many of the uh, liberal Western democracies uh, across Europe. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to, to finish with uh, two slides on Cognitive warfare, and I have to give full attribution to this to uh, Dr. Alina Barganal, who is uh, a senior expert in the Strategy Center and also uh, teaches at a university there in uh, Bucharest. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But um, so I've adapted this from a brief she gives. I recommend that you get her brief at some time in detail because uh, I'm just talking about kind of about what it is. She goes much further to examine how you understand it and also then what should you start doing about it. I'm just going to kind of tell you here's what I think it is. And, and I think and I think if you look down on my uh, little note in the bottom there, if, if you're familiar with Russian reflexive control, which is the concept to, to, you know, basically get people to do things without them realizing that you're getting them to do it. Um, and I think this this cognitive warfare is taking that concept and the Russians have figured out with cyber AI information warfare that they can manipulate and get the effects of reflexive control 
uh, in, in this cognitive warfare approach and using the latest technology. And this is all enabled by social media. They can move forward and really uh, begin to manipulate people in societies without them even realizing it. They just have to be at the right place, go right, go straight to the people, manipulate people. It's a, an integration of cyber information, psychological and social engineering capabilities, uh, running on social networks. Targets both influ influential in individuals, decision makers, uh, specific groups. It can be large, it can be a large part of a society, it can be massive, it can be serial. And then it all is mixed in with the internet and social media, you know, people that are or, for example, you know, you ask them, well, why do you believe that crazy theory? Well, I read it on the Internet and, and then you find out, well, they listen to one narrow channel on Facebook or on Twitter and that's all they listen to. They don't hear anything else anymore. It's not like it used to be, say, when, you know, when I grew up where we had three TV stations that were all pretty well balanced, ABC, NBC, CBS. We're pretty well balanced and, and you know, the way they might have led one way or the other, but generally you got a mixed view. A lot of people now just get the one little narrow view that they want to hear and it gets reinforced. So when you take the internet and social media, you drive with big data algorithms, uh, machine learning, AI, and it all happens below public radar. You know, it's it's uh, even it could even be WhatsApp or Telegram, that sort of messaging, and um, and there's ex exponential effects of this network offense that go with it. And in the end, it's relatively cheap to do this. It's billions versus billions. Uh, you know, you spend uh, billions on weapon systems to defend yourself, and spending a, a relatively low number of millions. You could have a revolution caused in your country or a civil war by these manipulative techniques and 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 how they can be then uh, taken and exploited by as i said in the other page by people who are corrupt and want to make money off it and things like that uh one last slide on this um, so i think it's important that we um you know, it's, you just can't fix it by giving people better facts. Like I said, if, if you're talking about better facts and the person only gets their information off of WhatsApp or Twitter and that's not and you're not in that sphere, then you're never they're never going to see it. And so just stopping the Russian bots isn't going to do it. You have to move towards thinking about it as an ongoing battle for the integrity of our information infrastructure. It's as important as the integrity of our financial markets. Um, and that was uh, come from an article from Rene Doresti down there. So in some cases, I did give attribution. Um, but it, it, the end result here is we're seeing every major controversy in our society, our emotion, identities, and differences all being weaponized. Everyone, we're all at each other's throats all the time. And, and we get to the point where we have information fatigue. We can't decide what the truth is, and we no longer care. And frankly, there was a time when Russian malign influence was targeted towards getting a position. Now I think they're just targeted at chaos. I mean, their goal is to polarize, disrupt, and render the public ungovernable if they can. They they have realized, at least Russia, that we, that they will never be able to compete with us in a head-to-head. -head. So the best thing they can do to the West to keep them at bay is to bring them down to their level, and that's what they're about. And information warfare and cyber together with AI, frankly, are the major enablers for this to happen. Okay, so that's my last slide. I hope this was uh, interesting for you, and uh, look forward to uh, some dialogue at the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Melker. Uh, thanks for uh, depicting a very frightening perspective and uh, adding to our uh, uh, Black Sea region nightmares. But uh, you did a great uh, uh, sharing with us uh, your views. They should generate vivid discussion, I suppose, uh, during the Q&A uh, session. Hopefully you could attend this. Thanks a lot. And now we are Yes, please. Oh, no, I said, I'll, I'll stick around. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, now we are moving to some practical use cases. Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, uh, looking to some uh, that really ha is happening today. Uh, I'm referring to blockchain. You know, the blockchain technologies uh, predominantly to date have the potential to disrupt many aspects of financial services and beyond. However, the fundamental concept behind a distributed ledger maintained by members of a network rather than one central location could enable malicious activity including data releases uh, from uh, breaches, command and control communications to malware and additional DDoS activity. Further, due to the decentralized and replicated nature of blockchain, takedowns of malicious domains would likely require that the entire blockchain be shut down, something that is unfeasible to do as many legitimate services run on these blockchains. It is my pleasure, pleasure to invite uh, to um, deliver uh, 
a very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, two experts from uh, our special telecommunications service. Uh, it's, uh, I'm talking about uh, Mr. Gabriel, uh, Gabriel David, Head of ITC Security Directorate, uh, who is an engineer by trade. Uh, between 2014-2017, he was Senior Security Engineer at Ad Marketplace LLC. Uh, previously, he was head of section and uh, system administrator, both in the special telecommunications services. He holds a master's degree and a bachelor's degree from the electronics and telecommunications faculty, uh, Bucharest University. Uh, he's actually, uh, uh, together with uh, Adrian Sengheorghe, uh, who is actually is the head of uh, R&D Directorate at Special Telecommunications Service since 2018. Uh, previously, uh, Adri Adri Adrian, he worked as head of Program Management Directorate uh, and uh, Business Development Manager at Sarah Goran Networks uh, Limited. He has a master's degree from the Electronic Center Communications Faculty, Bucharest University, Polytechnic University, and graduated from Acebus EMBA, Washington University, Seattle, Kennesaw State University, Atlanta. So, uh, over to you, uh, dear gentlemen. Uh, uh, please take the floor and uh, uh, deliver the presentation. Thank you, Rapaz. Hello, everybody. My name is Gabriel David, and uh, I will be joining you. We'll make a short presentation concerning the mechanisms of technology applications for electoral processes. As the presenter already said, uh, we are doing some applied application, which is more focused on what our services is able to provide for uh, Romania than for our citizens and for electoral. And, uh, Excuse me, sir. It seems that the sound is not good enough. Could you in, uh, increase a little bit uh, the level of somebody to take this okay. under consideration? Can you hear? Yes, better? now it's it's much better. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I, I will start uh, from the beginning. So uh, my name is Guy Gabriel David, and together with my colleague Adrian Singh We'll start uh, a short presentation concerning the emergency technology application for electoral processes. And uh, we'll start with this application is more focused on practical aspects. So uh, we are trying uh, now to, uh, to, to provide you some uh, insights uh, of the uh, one new emerging technology, which is the blockchain technology. And uh, we are trying to, uh, to share with you and with your guests. Uh, all the aspects that uh, we face in order to implement uh, this technology in our system systems. Okay, so next slide. Uh, so, but, uh, we'll start with some uh, blockchain technology fundamentals because it's very important to have a common ground about it. And the uh, blockchain technology means a particular form of this technology, which is constantly growing, in which records the transaction and data are structured in blocks, interlinked by a cryptographic system that makes it impossible to alter their history. Uh, in this sentence, there are a lot of uh, properties actually uh, for the blockchain technology. And one important thing is the fact that all the data are structured in blocks. And all these uh, blocks they have are linked by a cryptographic property. And also the history thing is very important, and you'll see later how this uh, all these properties are uh, used for assuring a, a proper voting system. So we are uh, in order to have a blockchain. Uh, basically, uh, being a decentralized architecture is very important to have a consensus mechanism. So uh, in the blockchain, the consensus mechanism, uh, there are three types of uh, mechanisms. One is proof of work, one is proof of stake, and one, one is proof of authority. And I'll explain a little bit later uh, what are these. Uh, basically, proof of work mechanism requires that the hashes of the blocks 
added to the blockchain, they uh, must have a certain property. For instance, starting with a certain number of zero, uh, this uh, is uh, very hard. Usually it's a mathematical um, algorithm that must be solved uh, in order to, uh, to assure this uh, property. And this property, the proof of work protocol requires also miners to go through an intense trial and error race to find the nonce of the block. Well, okay, now I, I have introduced some of the uh, properties of the blockchain and the member of, of the blockchain. So uh, in the block blockchain, there are full blocks uh, that contain the blockchain and they are uh, also work type of workers and all these workers are, are named uh, miners. That's why, that's why we already talk about the miners. And only blocks with a valid nonce, the nonce is the property that we already discussed about it, can be added to the chain. So uh, for the you know, blockchain technology, here there are some features. The technology is a pen-only technology, which means that the data can be only entered but never deleted. And this is related to our history property that uh, the blockchain has. It's public and available. What, uh, what does it mean? It means that all the participants can read the data, so everybody can have access to the data. And uh, there are also some validation rules uh, 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 at the block level. Block, block level. So uh, it means that only data that have a certain format can be added. Uh, so we are moving forward to the next slide, please. So as I already said, there are two types of nodes in the blockchain technology. One node is the full node, the node that own the entire blockchain and are responsible for verifying its integrity. And also the miners, uh, this node actively search for suitable nodes values. So they are solving that complex mathematical uh, problems in order to, uh, to uh, find the nodes values. Uh, and create the right hash and only a block that have that specific nonce in it uh, is able to be added uh, to, to the blockchain. Uh, in the schema, it's basically a schema that uh, shows you how a miner is working and all the, the blocks are hashed and all the hash are in the blockchain. Then the next slide, please. So um, if you are using the blockchain solution, there are some advantages. Uh, by the fact that the technology is distributed, so there is no single point of failure. Uh, another property is the fact is based by the fact that each block contains a hash calculated over, over all of the previous blocks, and the system can be checked very easily. Uh, and in order to modify a specific block, it is necessary to recalculate all the hashes for the following block. It is not easy because the effort to find the right nonce value is exponential. As I already said, there are three types of uh, consensus mechanisms inside uh, that can be used by uh, a blockchain technology. And the second one is proof of stake, uh, which is uh, different from proof of work, which is based on external investment. Proof of work are based on industry consumption and hardware. And proof of stake blockchain is secure in the deterministic way. And the validation of the blocks are depending on the number of the points or number of the uh, blocks that you are uh, owing. And another type is proof of authority, which is the most centralized consensus protocol and, and has a predetermined block validator. And all participants in the network know who the validation are. Are and the new blocks on the blockchain are created uh, based on the majority vote. So now we have all the all the types of consensus defined. And uh, uh, in order to, if you are moving to the next slide, uh, there is a schema based on uh, how uh, that we use uh, when we uh, choose the blockchain technology for our system. So basically, you have to answer to yes to all these these questions. And the question are uh, related to what you are trying to solve and what you are trying to do. And you have to answer to yes, uh, does the application involve the database? Uh, is the database updated by many users? Are the issues caused by a central entity third party? Do the transactions from the database depend on each other or are interactive? 
And if you are answering with yes to all these questions, so yes, you can use uh, a blockchain technology uh, for uh, your purpose. And uh, that uh, analyze will be our, our uh, institution when we, we decide to, to, to use the uh, blockchain technology or uh, some uh, aspect of the um, voting process in Romania. If you are moving further uh, to the next slide, you will see that uh, um, blockchain uh, is a secure information storage technology, as I said, is decentralized and distributed. And there are other properties that can be public, private, and hybrid. Decentralized means without any central server. Distributed that can run on different, uh, on as many PCs called nodes in a point-to-point -point architecture. So it's basically everybody with everybody will discuss. So what does it mean? It's public. Public means that the blockchain nodes have all the rights. So anyone can enter, create, and validate transactions. And uh, in a private blockchain, not all the nodes have the same rights. Anyone can enter, but only a small group can create, validate, and verify transactions. And um, anyone can check the entire blockchain. It's a kind of democracy, let's say. And it's a mixture between public and private, uh, the uh, uh, hybrid. And the, in the hybrid blockchain architecture, uh, it's used, this type of architecture is used uh, for optimizing working times and the uh, usual um, uh, search for and validation operations are, are performed in the blockchain uh, in the public part. And the most operations are dying, uh, are done in the private uh, section of, of, of the blockchain. So now we have all the uh, uh, definition and all the background uh, related to, to the blockchain technology. And if you are moving further, you'll see that uh, the blockchain, please, next slide. Uh, some real life application of the blockchain. Uh, the most uh, known one or the most common one is the with use for cryptocurrency. But uh, all these blocks, uh, all the blocks in the blockchain can store obviously any type of data. Also, can be used for smart contracts. Uh, these smart contracts are basically blockchain programs, not uh, very different from the papers. Uh, also, the blockchain technology can be used for certification and inspection of goods, uh, where users can enter various documents directly in the blockchain. And this allows uh, to prove at any time the authenticity, but also the belonging of these documents. And uh, least but not last, for electronic voting system. And um, with all the properties that I already said, uh, and I already present to you, uh, the electronic voting system, uh, can be also uh, a candidate for uh, for using this technology. And blockchain represents not only a way in which votes can be recorded in the database uh, that is also uh, impossible to change, but also a transparent method by which the counting of vote can be verified by any voter using the system. Uh, so we have all the ingredients, we have all the necessary properties, but uh, we'll see that there are some parts <laughs> here uh, that uh, my colleague Adrian Sengurge who uh, will discuss with you later about uh, our implemented, already implemented system and uh, what uh, are the next steps in order to have a real electronic voting system. Uh, if you are going further, in order to have uh, an efficient voting system, you have to have some uh, minimum uh, security requirements. Uh, and uh, the most important one, in my opinion, it's actually there are three. One is an anonymity. Anonymity of the system refers uh, to the fact that the, the, there should be no link between the vote and the voter. So no link between the vote and the voter, very important. The, so there should be no trace of it. The system must have some internal audit mechanism and the system must warranty the integrity of the system. The blockchain technology can ensure all of this uh, by giving the blockchain information, by the fact that the, the blockchain information being public and decentralized, 
the system is easy, uh, auditing the system is uh, very easy to be performed. Also, the risk of the whole electoral process being compromised is reduced in term of, terms of decentralization by the fact that each vote is encrypted uh, and that by the nature of the blockchain technology, each node is represented by a public identifier and not by personal information, the system can ensure the property of anonymity. And also the system integrity is one of the most easily secured property through blockchain, because blockchain by itself ensures data integrity by design. Um, uh, given each data block of this potential to reduce the block. So, next slide, please. Now, here uh, we have some uh, existing blockchain based uh, technology on the market, and uh, they are here, it's, it's a list of them. They are based on different frameworks like Bitcoin, Ethereum, they are written on different programming languages, uh, C, Python, or whatever. But the biggest problem uh, in adopting blockchain based technology uh, for the voting system these days is the scalability. And you'll see there are other problems that we identified uh, during our implementation that Adrian will uh, talk, uh, will share with you. And also the time to create a data block to be accepted in the blockchain is relatively long. So now we have all the, 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 the blockchain properties. We have the consensus mechanism defined and uh, we have defined the architecture which is uh, decentralized and you'll see how actually we implemented that which type of uh, uh, consensus we we, we we used in our next slide please Adrian good afternoon everybody thank you very much for the opportunity to participate to the conference i hope that you are hearing me well can you give me a feedback if it's everything okay? fine everything is fine thank you okay thank you very much and uh, now i will uh, present uh, the practicalities regarding what my colleague presented as uh, theoretical parts in uh, the first part of the presentation what I have to, to tell you is that STS, our institution, uh, has a partnership with the Permanent Electoral Authority in Romania and we give them support from the technical point of view in order to uh, have an electoral process uh, quite uh, correct. And, uh, and transparent. And for this, we have prepared for a few years ago two systems. Uh, one of them is called ISMPV, the other one SICPV. These two systems are related to the monitoring uh, turnout and preventing illegal voting, illegal voting. And the other one is related to centralizing the, the votes, the reports which are done after the voting process. Uh, we want to, to modernize uh, and to introduce the new technologies and all the time we are having in our mind to put in practice these uh, new technologies. And we have decided together with the Permanent Electoral Authority to introduce the blockchain as a technology which is bringing uh, immutability of the data used in the computer applications and uh, some other benefits which will be presented later on. The architecture of the, is the system you have used in the electoral process is a private one. This is very important to, to tell you, it's not a public one. And it's based on the type of consensus called proof of authority made at the level of the databases we are using in order, in order to be as close as possible to the data sources which are the, delivered by the two applications I have mentioned before. Uh, the system is uh, ensuring the notarization of unchanging of the information for the two systems which are um, used in the electoral process. The two centralized applications, SIMPV and SICPV, anchor to the data with the blocks, this being cryptographically linked to the other blocks at a certain time interval. 
by using cryptographic algorithms, it is guaranteed that the information in the two computer application will not change. This is very important. And the use of a single node could support the high rate of transaction, up to 100 of transaction per second. Uh, we have used this kind of uh, architecture due to the fact that we are, let's say, the developer of this application and uh, due to the fact that we have to cope with hundreds of transactions per second. This was the reason we have decided not to use a distributed architecture, which is more common uh, find in uh, blockchain technology. The entire volume of data anchored in the blockchain was also available in a blockchain explorer computer platform displayed on the public web portal. Starting with 2020, uh, due to the or uh, in the electoral uh, process in the parliament elections, we have used for the first time this application, this blockchain, uh, and uh, the the public. The, the public had access to the voting.roaf.ro uh, uh, website, access to, to the data which was uh, uh, presented uh, in, the, in the election, uh, definitely taking into account the GDPR uh, regulations in order not to, to, to disclose more than is necessary. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, I, I will uh, speak a little bit about the advantages uh, we obtain using the blockchain solution. And uh, this where uh, data integration becomes guaranteed by the properties of immutability, traceability and transparency of, offered by the blockchain technology. The confidentiality of the, the data is maintained and with the proposed solution, it will be not possible to access personal data as I uh, presented previously. Personal information from these two application is not publicly disclosed and it is based on a hash function which is included in the blockchain and which is published on the website. Records added to the blockchain log are protected and secured against alteration or deletion of the entity. The blockchain is immutable to changes in information already closed and sealed. This information which is kept in the blockchain can be uh, checked. If you go to the site I have mentioned before, you will see the data is still there and it can be verified uh, over the time. Trust is increased by the impossibility of modifying the information registered in the blockchain. The possibility to verify the data stored in the blockchain system will be feasible through the interface provided by our institution. And as I mentioned, there is a website you can find all the data about this. In addition to this, we created a REST interface, a REST API interface which was uh, valid and available for the NGOs and other uh, person interested to check that uh, in real time the data is not changed. The auditing process is synchronized to validate the data in real time. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now you have uh, on the screen the, the architecture, the, the basic architecture we have used um, in the election process in 2020, as I told you. You can see that there are two databases which are replicated in a blockchain databases and the, the API interfaces which gave access to the public NGOs and other persons interested to check in real time or after that if the information is uh, still immutable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we know that this is a first step. Uh, definitely we are targeting to for um, uh, going to the electronic voting. 
but this was one of the first steps our institution proposed to the Romanian electoral uh, permanent authority. And definitely we are having on uh, the design next steps, which will improve somehow the voting process. But uh, speaking about the, the voting process in general, we can say that um, uh, in order to have a voting system based on uh, entirely on the blockchain, the voter cannot easily verify that his vote was recorded correctly. Although the blockchain guarantees the integrity of the data inside it, there is no guarantee that the votes recorded in the system are exactly those cast by voters. This is due to the fact that the cryptographic protocols that guarantee this aspect are not compatible with blockchain-based uh, protocols. Uh, as well, it is difficult to manage the keys given that the technology is distributed and if the blockchain does not consist of enough nodes, the data can be easily altered. In the case of the voting application in the previous section, the blockchain consists of the pool of several servers controlled by the company that provides the voting services. These are some general uh, conclusions related to the, the uh, electronic vote, which it's uh, facing all the, the countries in the world. As we know, there are some countries which are a little bit more advanced in this um, uh, aspects and in this uh, process. But uh, honestly speaking, I think that there is no country in the world which proof that these kind of systems are fully reliable and there are still working on improving them and finding the, the correct way to do it in order that all the parties to feel safe, secure and confident that their vote is exactly what they, it's their decision. Thank you very much. I think that this was the, the last slide in our presentation. If uh, there are questions, we are ready to, to answer them. And uh, again, thank you very much for your invitation to participate in this program. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent briefing and for uh, uh, delivering a very quick but very concentrated uh, um, picture of uh, your successful story, uh, improving our voting systems and uh, actually violation at national level uh, is relying now on this uh, new and very interesting uh, technology that is applied in, uh, in uh, voting system. Thanks a lot and maybe some questions will be on during the Q&A session. And now we are moving to uh, Mr. Ofo Rodberg, who is a senior manager with 25 uh, years of experience in the cyber world. I hope I'm not uh, doing a mistake. So, uh, okay, so uh, yes, uh, it's about introducing Cyber Shield, defending the modern battlefield presentation. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Of uh, Rothberg, uh, a senior manager with a very long experience in the cyber world, he's the head of EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response Group at Elbit Systems starting uh, April 2020. He holds a Master of Science degree in Computer Science from the IEC Herslia and throughout his career, he has led activities in the field of cybersecurity from a variety of angles. Product management, defining uh, product requirements, uh, working closely with uh, uh, research and development teams, working with customers and reporting to C-level management, research and development. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I, I hear you, sir. And, um, Yes, uh, over to you, sir, uh, to uh, please uh, take the floor for uh, delivering your uh, briefing, uh, thoughts, views on this very important uh, topic. Just a minute.
Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I uh, hear you loud and clear. And uh, okay. I see uh, your, uh, it seems to be the first slide of the presentation. Yes, yeah, so can I share my uh, presentation? It's on the screen, actually. Okay, so this is just uh, only the first uh, slide, ah, I think. It's not the presentation. No. Is it possible to share uh, the yes. presentation? The, our colleagues will uh, help you. Okay. If they are on, uh, on uh, I will uh, ask them to start doing yes. this. If they are not yes. uh, following us. Okay, there is a button here that uh, with the plus button. So maybe I can present from this uh, button. Just yes, please try it. Uh, no, this is only taking. Uh, Somewhere it should be a. Uh, never used uh, this uh, system, so. If you can on the right, just, uh, on the right corner, uh, so, uh, down right corner, you there is something. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Let, let Found it. Found it. Okay. Just, uh, just a minute. So, can you see my screen now? Can you see the, the presentation? Yes, right now it's, it's loading. It's downloading. Ah, it's loading. It's loading. Okay. So once you see the slide, just uh, give me um, give I will give you the feedback. It seems oh, okay. to not be so too long. Yes, it's it's on the screen. You so can is start. It in good is it in the right. Yeah, this is, you see the, the screen in full size. It's right? not in, in presentation. It's not in presentation. It's just. Uh, oh, okay. Let me just. Uh, now it's better. Is it better right now or still uh, the same? It's still the same. Okay. Let me try it again. It's the same. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay. Please. Uh, okay, so let me start. Yes. And Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for the, the introduction, for inviting me for uh, to attend this uh, event. Um, as you said, my name is uh, Offer, and I'm working for uh, LB System. I will just uh, uh, introduce uh, it in a minute. I've been active in the field of cybersecurity for the last uh, 25 years. Uh, both uh, from the technology and the operational aspects. Uh, most of it in the Israeli Defense Forces. I retired actually uh, some years ago, uh, the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And my agenda for today is that I plan to share with you some our view on the cyber security uh, for the future uh, battlefield. So uh, let's start. Just uh, two slides on Elbit, just to, to let you uh, be familiar with the, the company. So uh, we are a major uh, defense uh, company uh, in Israel, actually. It's an international uh, company. 
We are engaged in a wide uh, range of programs uh, throughout uh, the world, uh, primarily defense and also uh, homeland security. Major activities are uh, land, aerospace, uh, EW, and of course, uh, command and control, uh, intelligence, C4I, and cyber. Uh, focusing on our uh, C4I and uh, cyber activities, uh, our, our division is active uh, in the field of uh, digitized uh, transformation for the future battlefield for more than 20 years now. Uh, we are working uh, closely with many uh, modern uh, militaries and have a vast uh, operational experience uh, in modernizing and digitizing uh, the equipment, the weapon system, the network, uh, providing uh, uh, efficiency and operational value. So, I've seen a lot of uh, nice uh, things in uh, with the, the former uh, presentation uh, and the colleagues. And, and just uh, to say the few uh, technologies uh, that we can uh, leverage in the battlefield is the artificial intelligence. Uh, we see more and more uh, networks that are providing common operational picture, COP. Uh, we are kind of seeing the introduction of uh, 5G networks uh, again. Uh, they would be used, uh, I believe, in militaries and future battlefield. We are seeing uh, software defined uh, design uh, radios and cloud. And actually, and uh, those are all uh, um, very sophisticated and complement, uh, 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 advanced uh, technologies, and uh, we will see them in the in the battlefield and have the, the potential uh, to provide better efficiency. But in the same time, uh, these disruptive technologies uh, can be used. Uh, to actually to uh, to attack the feed and lead to catastrophic results. For example, uh, if I inject a, a wrong element into the common operational picture, I can uh, gain some uh, 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 gain some um, leverage on my uh, opponent. Uh, I can disrupt the, the common operational picture. Uh, if I'm hacking into the software design uh, uh, radio, uh, I can maybe bypass a uh, security mechanism. Uh, if I'm, and I think uh, one of the former speakers talked about it, if I'm, um, if I understand how the AI algorithms work and what they are looking for, maybe I can bypass the, the, those algorithms and jamming the automatic target execution acquisition, jamming the computer vision algorithms. So actually the, the main message in this slide is that there are a lot of opportunities uh, for the future battlefield, but in the same time, uh, the, the, the threats are advancing in, in the same uh, in the same pace. Um, and I heard a nice analogy for uh, this uh, this kind of uh, operations. It's like when you uh, buy a new car; it will be a fast and, and a very modern car. Uh, and if we look at cyber as the brakes for this car, so I believe that uh, you won't be using some old, uh, outdated uh, brakes for this modern new car. You will need the new brakes, the, the brakes that will help you to stop uh, when you need them. So this is a nice analogy. And while advancing with those uh, great technologies, we must... Uh, uh, keep in mind that we have to invest in the cyber security as well. So, although we don't hear too much about cyber operations against weapon system in the news, 
we do see a rise in nation awareness. So I gave here just a few examples of a recent reports from the US, the UK, and others that emphasize what we all already know. Weapon systems are in the best case scenario, protected with outdated security mechanisms, like when I speak with customers, uh, I hear that, uh, in, again, in the best case, there are some antivirus uh, mechanism on the endpoints, maybe some uh, firewalls, but you know, those uh, equipment are, and controls are uh, the same one that we used uh, before uh, 15 years or so. Uh, and we don't see any other modern cybersecurity elements uh, for those systems, and actually those reports are saying just, uh, just, uh, just this. This case calls for uh, immediate action, and I, again, I quoted here something that is written in one of these reports. Uh, just because you don't hear about it doesn't mean no one is trying. And actually, I believe that once you gain all these beautiful technologies and implement them in the battlefield, someone will be trying to hack them and uh, turn them uh, against you. So the question is, why are we still unsecure? The uh, situation in the battlefield is different than the situation in our offices and our modern uh, networks. A uh, couple of reasons. First, we see a long development cycle. Uh, it takes a lot of time to develop a new platform, and those platforms are uh, meant to stay for years. So we are seeing more and more legacy, unpatched, vulnerable systems in the field. Um, customers are uh, uh, approaching me and asking me to defend uh, their uh, Windows XP systems and maybe older. Uh, and you know, Windows XP is very difficult to defend. Uh, we see lack of awareness. So if I am the one that is buying this platform, this for example, this tank, and you are the one that is selling this tank, probably both of us are not aware of the cyber risks that are out there. So I will not ask it and you will not sell it. Uh, Usually those platforms are mission critical. Uh, so the customer and also the provider um, are reluctant to install any new software or hardware on top of this equipment. They are afraid, in, they are afraid that it will be uh, dysfunction. And lastly, um, oh, system... Sorry, sir, for interrupting you. Uh, could you check again uh, the slideshow because it seemed that something uh, got wrong and we couldn't see the slides moving. Uh, so in, so in which slide are you? I'm lost in the uh, slides. <laughs> could you just check again to see if we, you can uh, share with us the slides? Yes, sure. Yes, please. When you went, excuse me, my name is Alexander Jodesk. When you went to full screen, we couldn't see your full screen. We saw just the frozen slide show in the beginning. So maybe just show us the slides, show us the PowerPoint without going to full screen. Okay. And then just switch the slides from the left hand side. Yeah, and that way try. we can see the slides running. So now I'm not in uh, presentation mode. Just uh, give me a feedback if you can hear it, if you can see it. Yes, yes, we see, we could see the yeah the slide number uh, nine nine I think yeah the the one with the the with the tank uh, main battle tank. tank yes okay the, so and, and you haven't been able to see the other slides before it yes if you could just uh, get through them again would be very nice to. Not lose okay. what important things you succeeded to deliver verbally. Okay, Thanks, so I will thanks go. again. 
Yeah, yes, sure. I, I'm Great. sorry, I Great. apologize. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's it, now it's good. It's good. Thank you so much. Okay, so in this slide, I've talked about it. You probably heard me, but couldn't see it. We talk, uh, I, I just showed all the beautiful and, and uh, very uh, advanced technologies that we'll see in the future battlefield. And actually, we already see them. The AI, the common operational picture, the, the advances in the networks like 5G and the software-defined radios. We, can, we will also see some cloud instances in the in the battlefield and they will provide better efficiency in the battlefield for sure but actually at the same time and i just copied the same technologies for the right side for the red or orange side those technologies can be used against us and will be used against us and if they are unprotected and maliciously um, uh, used by uh, the attacker, uh, they can, uh, the basis, we can lose trust in those systems. And uh, also the, the hacker can use them in order uh, uh, to provide the, or to uh, pull some catastrophic results uh, for our, our end, like, uh, like uh, for example, misclassifying some objects in the field or um, uh, um, some confusing confusion between uh, the allies uh, and, the, and the other side. So those are the kind of uh, problems that will be, uh, uh, will be present one, once we implement those systems and we will not protecting them as we should. Uh, so I'm not the only one that's saying it. As I said, there are public stores, uh, US and the UK emphasize that the weapon systems are not secure. They actually, they are not secure as all. Uh, and this calls for this calls for action. So if we again, if we uh, ask ourselves why those critical systems are not secured. Again, those are the reasons that I talked about, the long development cycles, uh, the lack of awareness, uh, the reluctance to install any new component software or hardware on top of this system. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, approaching or uh, looking at the whole system as black box. So if I want to add something, I should do some kind of integration and maybe some experiments, operational exper experiments, and those are open systems. And if we often, sometimes my customers ask me, how can I hack this tank, right? So this tank is usually not connected to the internet. So uh, I think there are uh, many vectors, many attack vectors the attacker can use. For example, uh, he can use the supply chain in order to uh, uh, to add something to to one of the components, one of the computers or the networks elements in the in this tank, and this component can be triggered uh, in some use case. Once it, it is triggered, it can actually um, destroy or uh, jam the operations in uh, the tank. So this is a very challenging uh, mission. Uh, and first, we should start talking about uh, cyber resilience, not only about cyber protection. Uh, because we cannot just copy paste our methodology and tools from our uh, enterprise networks into the into the battlefield. The elements in the battlefield are sometimes connected from the uh, disconnected from the network. And the, the operators in the field, the, the war fighters, they are not cyber experts. So if I uh, raise some alert and 
uh, ask them to, to investigate it. There will be no investigation in the field, right? Uh, so we have to think differently. And one of the first uh, uh, thing I suggest uh, to, to think about is moving to cyber resilience. Uh, so the, the, the definition of cyber resiliency uh, is uh, to operate uh, in a disgraded environment while there are some cyber operations uh, against you, maybe trying to hack uh, the computer or the platform. And we uh, expect the cyber uh, security elements to uh, detect those uh, attacks and prevent them uh, from happening and actually not disturbing the uh, the war fighter or the operator at all. We at Elbit uh, came up with a holistic program we call CyberShield because we think it's not just uh, one element that you uh, should uh, implement and that's it. Uh, you should think about the cybersecurity process from the preparation to the response. Uh, you have to consider the endpoints, the network, the tactical SOC. This is a little bit different from the standard SOC we are familiar with. And also, uh, if you want to examine your system and check the resilience level, uh, I suggest to do it in, in, a, in a lab, which is uh, offline, not in, of course, in the field itself. Uh, and here we offer uh, four major components uh, to mitigate uh, those capabilities. We covered those capabilities. The first one, we called it CyberSheet Endpoint, which is a tactical endpoint protection, a full standalone advanced uh, software solution uh, for the endpoint. And when we say endpoint, we say, of course, the tactical computer, but it can also be a sensor. It can also be a weapon uh, system like uh, a missile or a drone or anti-missile uh, 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 system. And this is the first element, and it covers uh, the standard, let's say, uh, capabilities, but also the advanced one, because usually once the attacker will strike you in the field, he will use uh, advanced capabilities. Um, we also uh, have a component we call CyberSheet Network, which is covering the, uh, the unique requirements for the network. Usually, uh, in the battlefield, we will see a dedicated unique protocols I mean data protocols uh, going on because of the nature of the, those systems. Those are not standard systems that we use every day in the office. So there is the protocol that uh, works with the engine. There is the protocol that works with the Canon. So we see a lot of protocols and usually it is very difficult to validate and detect some anomalies uh, for those protocols. And this is just the, the, the goal of this, uh, of this component. And the CyberSheet SOC is, uh, is like a, a one-stop solution for the tactical SOC. It has all the traditional uh, capabilities for uh, the SOC operators, but we believe that you also have to have some unique capabilities like situational awareness, because th those, again, those are not just the computers in the offices. Those uh, endpoints are uh, out there in the field, and we have to understand which endpoint is it and where is it located uh, in the field in order to, uh, to do some uh, decision making. Um, all the updates of the endpoints and the response actions uh, should, uh, should be done in an asynchronic way because, again, sometimes the endpoints are not connected at all. Uh, and lastly, we talk about the lab capabilities. Uh, and we believe 
that it is not just enough to talk about the resilience level of the system. You have to examine it. And it's actually like uh, some acceptance test that we do for our system. We have to do cyber acceptance tests and to check uh, in a real way, actually to, to test some, some malwares on top of uh, these systems, uh, it can be standard malwares, it can be advanced malwares that we inject uh, to these uh, systems. And one of the speakers uh, talked about uh, AI attacks. So actually, uh, in the future, I believe those systems will uh, include some kind of AI capabilities, and we should also uh, test those capabilities. So these are the main components that we believe should be uh, uh, built and deployed in order to have some kind of a, a solution uh, for uh, the future biofeed. And, you know, my, my last slide is just describing my view on how to start, because usually we see a very, uh, or a good, uh, cyber security for the again for the enterprise networks a lot of controls and uh, and the organizations are advancing there in a good pace uh, but in when we move to the bot feed and talk system and command and control system usually are uh, to blur uh, so first thing we have to decide to launch this uh, strategic program to handle the risk. The second step is to assess the risk, uh, taking into consideration the exposure level uh, of each critical system. Not every uh, system is exposed and not every system is, uh, is critical. And again, the potential impact. Uh, some, some systems are more important than others, so let's start with them. Uh, and I believe the holistic program should cover the people. Uh, I, we talked about training, uh, top table uh, exercises for the commanders and the people in the field, uh, processes, uh, and also tools. And I, I think that we have to start thinking about generic tools and not inventing a new tool for every system uh, we buy and deploy. Uh, so that's it. And uh, again, I thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak in uh, this uh, event. And I'm, again, I'm open to, to questions. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rodberg. Uh, we have another go. Uh, the last, uh, of course, the not really the pre uh, panelists that will deliver a very uh, short presentation and uh, we will start the uh, q a and uh, during the q a it seems that we already have some questions on the screen thanks again and uh, please don't leave us we have questions for you now uh, the last uh, uh, panelist is uh, lieutenant colonel uh, georgian tudor Actually, he is uh, head of space and radio communication agency of our Ministry of Defense since uh, July 2021. Uh, previously, he worked as uh, head of satellite communications office at our CIS command. Uh, he has a master's degree from the Bucharest University in computer system security and uh, he graduated uh, as a signal officer of the Land Forces Academy in 2002. Please take the floor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and uh, uh, deliver your very insightful presentation. Yes. Thank you, Colonel Burlaku, for your kind introduction. Can you hear me well? Of course. Yes. Everything good? good? Very well. well. Loud and clear. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My, my subject will be cybersecurity of space-based assets. And I will start my presentation by saying that the interruption of space services through a cyber attack could involve large and possibly very complex knock-on effects. As the space and cyberspace domains are linked operationally, 
space cannot exist without cyber and cyber in some cases without space and both of them enable all other war fighting domains land air and the sea next slide please On the slide, I presented some of the cyber attacks that were successful, and there are at least three occasions when that happened. In 1998, an unknown party took control of the US German X ray science satellite ROSAT. The attack was made via a satellite ground station, and in this particular case, computers at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland were hacked. And the, hack, the, and the hacker instructed the satellite to turn towards the sun. This effectively fried the satellite's batteries and optics, rendering the satellite useless. In 2007, the U.S. Earth Observation Satellite, Landsat 7, jointly managed by NASA, but, but by NSA and the U.S. Geological Survey, experienced 12 minutes of interference. This is an example of a direct attack on the satellite command and control link. The interference, the interference was only discovered following similar event in 2008. In both cases, the responsible party did not achieve all the steps necessary to command and control the satellite. In 2008, NASA Earth Observation Satellite Terra EOS M1 experienced two minutes of interference in June and nine minutes of interference in October. In both cases, the responsible party achieved command and control of the satellite. However, no commands were issued. The attack initially appeared to have come via the Kongsberg Satellite Service Ground Station at Svabart, but the facility owner saw no evidence of this. So therefore, it may have originated as a direct attack on the satellite command and control link. Next slide, please. From the small star revolution to Earth observation constellations, a very high throughput satellite, software defined satellite, or non geostationary software satellite constellation, the pace of satellite industry innovation has accelerated to un unprecedented levels. Scalability, multiplying number of beams and satellite skyrocketing in throughput, increasing number of set terminals, and flexibility, software defined payloads, network resources orchestration, network entry point diversity. In their wider sense are some of the biggest challenges ground segment developers need to respond. While there has been tremendous progress in ground segment technology, in elements like throughput efficiency and traffic optimization, there needs to be a leap in change. And that change is done by through software to software organization of the ground station and satellite. So you cannot control this satellite architecture if you don't go more on software defined. And that means you have to have more means to protect this architecture. Next slide, please. While generally not driving as much hype as other technology trends in the satellite ecosystem, ground segment virtualization is arguably one of the most critical transformation the industry will experience in the next coming years. Key to enabling capability and flexibility of the networks, infrastructure vendors, integrators and operators are racing to adopt a new virtual framework. Adopting of 5G standards will have multiple implications. From a market point of view, satellite will be much easier to implement for general telco users, key starting a number of new use cases. From an operations point of view, virtualization and 5G will trigger a reevaluation on how infrastructure and network capability are procured, prompting new business models as infra infrastructure as a service. Virtualization adds layers of technology which can increase the security management burden by necessitating additional security controls. Combining many systems onto a single physical computer can cause a larger impact if a security compromise occurs. Virtual system also makes it easier to share information between system. That's a convenient and regular IT operation, but can also be a way into a system for cyber threats. In some cases, virtualized environments are quite dynamic. 
that can also make creating and maintaining the necessary security boundaries more complex. Next slide, please. In the figure on the slide, you can see the continuum of reversibility to non-reversibility attack types against spacecraft. Cyber tasks on spacecraft could come in many flavors and depend greatly on adversaries' access and goals. Potential attack targeting ground stations could result in a breach of the confidentiality or integrity of the downlink data, or potentially the satellite being disabled, destroyed, or deemed unreliable. Attacks against the supply chain could result in a different, more limited set of attacks against the satellites. A range of scenarios exist and each would have unique impacts on the adversary's options. Some of these scenarios result in irreversible damage, while others result in loss of mission time and or degraded future operations. The more an adversary can sow doubt in the space system, the greater the impact on the military economic systems. Next slide, please. There are a lot of cybersecurity maturity standards and guidelines to help organization to improve their cybersecurity measure and best practices. But these are not directly applicable to the space domain. While efforts have been made to mold these frameworks for space uniformity is lacking and updated standards and guidelines for spacecraft are likely warranted. There are pockets of initiatives across the space community that are addressing the cybersecurity for space systems. A space system compromise and should have cybersecurity protection applied to all four segments, space, ground, link, and user. However, most work in this area focus on the ground segment with little research or guidance on the security of the space segment, I mean the spacecraft. Next slide, please. On this slide, they are summarized the main types of cyber attacks. One of the most likely consequences of the satellite cyber attacks is service disruption or even complete service denial. Service disruption, even as a result of an attack on a single satellite, has the potential to cause an immediate and significant impact on large groups of people across a wide geographical area. For example, service disruption to global position system satellites has the potential to impact not only the multitude of ground, sea, and air service that rely on their signals for accurate positioning, but also critical infrastructure, such as financial institutions and utility companies that rely on them for precise timing. On this slide, I, what I want to, to emphasize that uh, as in any cyber attacks, the main concern is that the attribution is limited or uncertain. You cannot uh, easily identify and retaliate who's doing the attack. Next slide, please. Most satellite launches in recent years rely on computers that are installed in the satellite themselves and that requires regular upgrade through remote access. In addition, the technology is often off the shelf and just as with electronic devices, a backdoor could be present in one of the many thousands of components in a single satellite, allowing cyber attacks hide and access. An attack could arrive via a ground station with the intent of causing a satellite to maneuver, decaying or lowering, lowering its orbit so that it re-enters the Earth atmosphere and bursts up. Even if there is no backdoor, current encryption is not always strong enough to deter determine sophisticated attacks. It is possible that a sophisticated attack could maneuver satellite so that it collides with another satellite or space objects. Alternatively, an attack could activate all the satellite's solar panels, deliberate overexposing them to highly energy ionizing solar radiation causing irreparable damage, as I saw in the case on the first slide. Next slide, please. As probably is noted, two US, US government F observation satellites were hacked in 2008 and 2007. The attackers gained entry into the system, but stopped short of issuing comments. However, they are believed to have acquired all the steps necessary to do so. In the event of a conflict, one country's ability to disable or destroy one or more of another country's satellites 
will give it a significant tactical advantage. Depicting on the, on the slide, you can see what is the result of an impact, a simulation of an impact of two satellites. There are many, many debris that uh, they will go into space. The danger of cyber attack that aim to take physical control of satellites have received far too little attention. Even so, such attacks will be of great global strategic importance. The main focus of concern has been the networks rather than satellites. Consequently, experts and policymakers have not understood the full implication and the range of potential consequences of a satellite takeover. Any satellite that can change orbit can be considered a space weapon. If the ob orbit changes so as to enter the path of another satellite, then a collision will ensue, destroying one or both of the satellites and creating space debris that will continue to pose severe risk for other satellites far into the future. In addition, the more satellites there are, the greater the possibility of collision with the breeze, leading to a cascade effect known as the Kessler effect. Next slide, please. The vulnerability of satellites and other space assets to cyber attack is often overlooked in wider discussions of cyber threats to critical national infrastructure. Nobody is fully prepared for the challenges created by meshing of space and cyberspace, especially for spacecraft. In the absence of formal policy and regulation, industry and government alike can begin to apply defenses at all segments with the space system to build a more robust security posture. Not all the, all the risk can be eliminated, and no decision maker, decision maker has a limited budget or enough personnel to combat all the risk. However, decision makers, acquisition professional program manager and system designer can consider the following key principle when designing a cyber resilient spacecraft. Intrusion detection and prevention, leveraging signature and machine learning to detect and block cyber intrusion on board space spacecraft. A supply chain risk management program to protect against malware inserted in parts and modules. Software assurance method with the software supply chain to reduce the likelihood of cyber weaknessing in flight software and firmware. Logging on board the safe cloud to verify legitimate operations and aid in foreign investigation after anomalies. A temper proof means to restore the spare cloud to a known good cyber safe mode and cryptography solution for use. Coming back to space, the disruption of capability that space assets provide will have immediate, far reach, and devastating economical, political, and geostrategical consequences. Over the past two decades, space vulnerabilities have grown dramatically in a matter commensurate with the terrestrial dependence on space based capabilities and enablers. This is true for both civilian and military activities. Possible Purposeful interference with space system could rather easily trigger a retaliatory spiral of actions that could compromise a safe and secure operation environment in space. Accordingly, having available a range of measures to prevent, preempt an incident or even full up conflict is a rapidly grow, growing importance to an in, increasing number of countries. So, I will finish my presentation in saying that space and cyberspace have a special, a special relations and we have to take both in account when designing and, and protecting our systems. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, yes, it, it, the conclusion uh, is very valid and uh, uh, it's obvious that uh, we have to have a holistic look when we are uh, uh, taking into consideration um, uh, space and cyber, uh, yes, uh, outer space and cyberspace. Of course, uh, all of the operational uh, uh, framework have to put together uh, the threats and uh, how we can uh, counter any threat in uh, this respect. Thanks again. And now we have a Q&A session. Unfortunately, it would be a very short, a short one. Uh, we have on the screen uh, just one question, uh, actually two, and uh, after that well, I will uh, try to provoke you and I hope uh, the panelists could uh, um, ask uh, questions uh, and uh, uh, 
um, answered each other uh, during this, uh, let's say, 30 minutes at least. Because you know, uh, during uh, due to the uh, uh, length uh, uh, presentation, we actually consume a lot of time uh, and. Uh, uh, but it was a good time and uh, uh, we uh, learned a lot, we took a lot of ideas and uh, yes, let's start with the question for Mr. Rodberg. So how to solve the interoperability issue regarding the cross domain and multi-layers interfaces, a tactical uh, radio networks contributing to the common operation picture, having in mind the different crypto algorithms used by national forces or inter-institutional agencies. Yes, it's a complicated one because, you know, uh, we are actually facing uh, the challenge of uh, uh, fighting uh, or preparing to fight in a coalition and uh, every the waveforms are uh, proprietary, uh, they are not uh, open and uh, sometimes it's difficult to do this. Please, Mr. Rothberg, uh, we are uh, waiting for your uh, answers. Have you got this question? It's on the chat screen, public chat. So it's about uh, cross-domain, how we can uh, cr uh, do cross-domain uh, um, data exchanges and uh, eventually how we can uh, do it, do it uh, between uh, different radio networks. It's not easy to, to fix these interoperability issues. Please. We don't hear you. We couldn't hear you. Could you We are seeing your lips moving, but there is no sound, I'm afraid. Maybe now? Okay, in the meantime, um, Another question uh, for everybody, uh, for all the panelists involved in this session. Uh, how to rapidly adapt the capability planning process to the emerging and disruptive technologies in the context of uh, legacy public acquisition and uh, or legal systems? More specifically, what could be the collaboration framework and mechanism, mechanism between the customers and the industrial stakeholders and providers to design, create, implement, and operate the highly technological-based uh, products like uh, those who, who are including artificial intelligence, autonomous devices, etc. Since the uh, requirements are to be debated and adapted during the agile preparatory phase. Are we ready for this? A long question. Who is uh, actually, who, who could start uh, answering this? Please take the floor. Somebody is trying. No. Uh, actually, I can I can try. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, so the space systems, they are in the front line of the of the innovations, and we we will always have to think about a new acquisition process because the old acquisition process takes too long and technology advances too fast. 
So one solution would be to get less and less when you want to acquire something to move slowly on what that system you want to acquire, want to do, and to think about less what technology needs to be used. So you, we can let a lot of innovation and, um, and uh, stimulate the industry to go to innovation in all of these domains and not be specifically uh, make the acquisition on one thing, you, I said robotics, and make a lot of details, just let the industry be more innovative and resolve these requirements for specific domains. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it seems that we have to do more to uh, leverage this uh, fast changing technologies, uh, adapting our, uh, our acquisition framework. Um, I have another one uh, that could be addressed to all of you. Um, it's about, uh, it's uh, very general in nature. So, uh, what can be done to improve military cooperation in the Black Sea region uh, when, with respect to uh, research and development and uh, so co cooperative uh, actions that are uh, trying to uh, increase uh, the level of uh, exchanges and uh, cooperation in the region? Somebody who is ready to pick this up. May I make sure yes. that I know? Yes, please. please. Thank you so much for the uh, courage. What, what I, I would like to mention here, and also in regarding the previous question as well, uh, it's interesting, it's, it, we should always remember that, especially for NATO, since it's an alliance, uh, it has always to be based every activity on standards and uh, in accordance with international law and, uh, of course, its, its core values. And uh, this is not always easy in the relevance of speed and adaptivity, adaptation. Uh, especially if we compare NATO to, to its adversaries, uh, the, the Red Team. Uh, and just to highlight that, I would like to mention that only a couple of weeks ago, NATO released its first ever strategy for artificial intelligence. And going to do that in the near future for the, for the other uh, disruptive technologies as well. So I, I, I think that can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you very well. Okay, I, I think uh, there was an interruption. Uh, hopefully, you could uh, hear my last uh, words. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, what, what the, the NATO's approach or, or regarding the artificial intelligence has it has to be always based and been in accordance of its values, and that takes some time and especially when it tries to uh, cooperate with industry and academia as well. So the, 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 the